Hey, this is the franchise Shane Douglas in the city that made me, or maybe the city that I made famous, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, getting ready to do the sit down a Legends interview on Hannibal TV, and what better place than right in front of the original ECW hotel, the Days Inn at the Philadelphia airport. It all started there and at the ECW arena, and right now, you're ready to hear it all on Hannibal TV. Yeah! <laughs> What was your childhood like growing up and where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in Pittsburgh, well, a little, I, I always say Pittsburgh, but it's about a mile, 30 miles north, uh, northwest, I guess, of Pittsburgh, a little town, town called New Brighton, Pennsylvania. Uh, wasn't a lot to do there. We, of course, like any kids in the States or any high school, I'm sure, the same in Canada, uh, grew up playing sports. Uh, if it wasn't organized sports, after school we were, Whatever the season was, we were playing football season, we were playing football, baseball season, basketball. We were always doing something around. There was I, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood that about 30 kids the same age, you know, year or two, three apart. So there was always enough kids to get a football game, a baseball game, a basketball game together. And we all grew up watching wrestling. In Pittsburgh, you know, the Steelers, of course, were great. The Pirates had just come off a few years before a World Series and would win one in a few, few more years in 79. Um, and then the, the hockey players, as you guys in Canada, the big hockey uh, area, uh, the Penguins hadn't yet reached great. They hadn't yet gone to the black and gold and reached great. They were still a pretty low-level team and got beat up pretty often. So we had the Steelers and we had the Pirates and we had Bruno San Martino in Pittsburgh uh, with studio wrestling on Saturday nights. Uh, my friends and I, uh, we all grew up you know very i wouldn't say poor we were fed and you know we were certainly low income uh but we didn't know it you know we we were on the run all the time we i look back on my childhood as having a norman rockwell childhood uh you know had lots of friends to play with had a loving mother and father although they were divorced uh I'd spend the weekends with my dad my sister and i and uh the rest of the week with my mother uh and uh and Professional wrestling, and uh, it was a big part of that. You know, we grew up reading comic books and went from comic books to wrestling magazines. And this, to show you my age, this all precedes cable television in Pittsburgh. So we could read about the NWA and we could read about these, you know, these Dusty Rhodes, Superstar Billy Graham matches in the uh, bull rope matches in Madison Square Garden, but we never saw the video of it. And of course there was no such thing as YouTube or uh, online streaming. So we read about it in the magazines and your imagination would take off. You know, you could just you run this movie in your head of what this match must look like. And in 1976, uh, cable television finally came to the area. And my dad was the first to have it. And I went over uh, to my dad's house that weekend. Uh, Saturday night, uh, my dad had the TV guide and saw that uh, WWF wrestling was on midnight, the WOR show. So my dad worked on the railroad uh, and he, uh, I, I had no idea, I loved professional wrestling. And he said, oh, there's wrestling on tonight, we, let's watch wrestling. Because he was always gone on the weekends, he'd come and go with the, working on the railroad. And he was home that night and we sat down, I remember he laid on the couch and I sat on the floor on the couch in front of him and the very first segment was Superstar Billy Graham with the Grand Wizard behind a cage talking about his upcoming cage match with Bruno San Martino and he had a, had a cabbage and shredded it on the on the cage and I remember this is a 13 year old kid watching that and you know this guy with this incredible muscles and tan and blonde hair and you know the gift of gab and it was just so it was like a comic book come to life and I was just like a you know a hook on a fish on the end of a hook I thought this is the coolest thing I've ever laid eyes on and I've been a big fan ever since and you did amateur wrestling too, is that correct? I did. Uh, I wrestled, uh, my high school, New Brighton High School, didn't have a, a wrestling team. Wrestling hadn't yet come. There were a few schools in the area. Uh, uh, Ambridge, uh, which is a four or five towns up for me, had it. Uh, uh, I think Center may have had it. There were a handful of schools that did have a wrestling program. New Brighton did not. Uh, when I was about five years old, my mother took me to a club out in Warren, Ohio, and which is a pretty good drive, and uh, about an hour drive, 45 minute drive. And I would go out there a couple times per month and wrestle, and had wrestled through amateur up until uh, till the time, about the time I was in high school. What led to you eventually becoming a professional wrestler? 
And it was di more difficult in those days, I assume. Yeah, well, cause we, there was no way of making contact. You know, we didn't know. I knew Bruno San Martino lived in Pittsburgh. I would have had no idea how to contact him or, or even if I had the balls to contact him if I did know how. Uh, my friends and I, we were pretty handy, and we had picked up a Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine, and a kid had gotten his picture in the, in the uh, magazine. He had built a homemade ring, and it was a really sorry looking thing i mean it had you know strings hanging like the ropes were sagging and like an old carpet rolled over it and we were all pretty handy and thought we can build a better ring than that so we set out to start doing it we went to the junkyard and found a big long what turned out to be aluminum uh like 30 foot pipe on the side of a tanker cut it down and cleaned it up uh made these boxes with these plates that had big bolts coming up out of them that we could screw the the corner post to and then we set down egg uh, you know uh, crates and then uh i uh, had uh plywood that we put uh, carpet padding and then my brother had just come home from the navy and had uh, naga hide imitation leather we put those over it so we had sort of an, a, a, a piece together wrestling ring and after we built that that was the summer of 1978 after we built it uh, and rolled around in it a couple weeks, we sort of got bored with it and thought, now what are we gonna do with it? And at that time, Muscular Dystrophy used to have the Labor Day Telethon where we would raise money. And they used to ask kids to do backyard uh, carnivals, you know, games and stuff, raise five, 10 bucks and send it into Muscular Dystrophy. I came up with the idea of let's have a backyard wrestling show. So all you backyarders out there, I was years and years before you. Uh, we went to meet a woman named Angeline Paparella, and I'll never forget her name, and the reason for that is uh, she was a nurse. I'm going to say she was probably in her 50s, give or take. Uh, she had been a nurse all of her professional life, and she had contracted adult-onset muscular dystrophy. So when we went to meet her about setting this up, uh, she was completely immobile. She was in a wheelchair that, you know, had a headrest and the only thing she could move was a couple fingers. She was completely immobile the rest. She had, you know, rest for her arms. And this woman, the reason I remember her name is not because she was my connection to wrestling, but because to see how hard this woman in this state worked, how courageously she worked to defeat muscular dystrophy was stunning. Uh, stuck with me today and will for the rest of my life just how courageous this woman was and I think I'm sure in hindsight she didn't say it at the time but I'm guessing that you know having a bunch of snot-nosed seventh and eighth graders walking in and telling her she, we wanted to put on this wrestling show she must have been taken back by that and she called me up about a week later and she said you know there's a professional wrestler that lives locally uh, he's an Italian guy and we, of course I said wait Bruno San Martino she said no no it's not Bruno and then she started fumbling over the name she said it's something like Dina Nini Donna Nina and, and she's fumbling like that and I said Dominic Danucci at the time he was world tag team champion in the WWF with Dino Bravo and uh, she said, that's it, Dominic Danucci. Well, you can imagine as a you know, 13, 14 year old kid, the world tag champion. And she gave me his phone number after getting permission to give it. I called and spoke to his wife, uh, Janine, who had just sadly passed away last, uh, last fall. And uh, she told me that Dominic was on the road and that he, he was due to be back on whatever day. And a, a friend of mine drove me out and he had not gotten home that day. So she said, I'll leave him the message and he, you know, when the show is, and she said, if he's in town, he doesn't think he's going to be, but if he's in town, he'll be stopping by. So we didn't even advertise. We told a few people, but we didn't advertise that Dominic Tanucci would be there because we weren't sure he'd show up. We said they had a beautiful Saturday afternoon, beautiful sunny day, and we set the ring up. And the ring, because of the sun, was like you could have literally fried eggs on it. It was <laughs> really not a ring I'd wrestle in today. Uh, but we ended up drawing about 75 people. We made, I think it was like $253 or something. And about halfway through the show, this big white LTD pulled up in the parking lot in the business next door. We had set up behind a, a my one friend's uh, father owned a bar. And we were set up in the back area and this big LTD pulled in. And I, I can still in my head see the door opening and just see this huge barrel get out. And it's this massive man get out of the car and stands up and as soon as he stood up, we knew it was Dominic. So I ran over to introduce myself to him and uh, 
he came over and started, you could tell, just taking it in and, you know, like sort of taken back by all of it. And he ended up getting involved, like he saw with the, us doing the matches. And, you know, for, for not knowing what we were doing, we did a pretty good job. The way we did it then is much like the kids in indie wrestling do today. We, we just scripted out a match. You know, we'll lock up and do this and then this. And then we practiced those over and over and over and over again. And we just went out and did what we had practiced. And uh, after the show, my brother-in-law, who was taking pictures from rooftops and things, had a lot of really cool pictures, different perspectives, took us out in front of the bar and took a picture of us all in our wrestling gear and Dominic. And as we're standing there setting up for the picture, Dominic said, uh, so how old are you punks anyway? And I said, uh, I'm 14, how, well, how old are you? And he looked at me and he said, ah, oh, you never ask a wrestler's age, kid. And, uh, and then he said he was 48 years old. So, you know, if you do the math, it was pretty easy to see, you know, as, as over the decades that I've known Dominic, he was uh, always much older, but, you know, in such incredible shape. He's 85 now, still sharp as a tack, still in very good shape for his age, still does sit-ups and leg-ups and everything every day. Uh, yeah, but that's how I met Dominic, and that was how I uh, got my foot in the door with wrestling. N never planning to. Uh, it was just that whenever I was in, a senior in high school and was getting ready to go to college, uh, I knew I wasn't going to be playing sports at college anymore. And having played sports most of my life, I wanted to do something to stay involved in sports. And so I asked Dominic if he would train me not to be a wrestler, just train me to stay, you know, stay in shape and to keep involved in something, knowing I was going to be coming home every week to work, every weekend. And he said that he would. Now, I just learned this recently. He said that he would uh, as long as I went to college. And what he recently told me was that my father, and this stunned me, uh, my father wasn't the kind of guy to do this kind of thing. Uh, but he drove out to Dominic's house, which is way in the back woods behind, uh, you know, out in the boondocks from where we live. And said, my dad, and he pointed out in his driveway, he said, it was right down there your dad pulled on, was working in the yard. And he said, my dad told him, yeah, you know, refuse to train him unless he goes to college. And I, I already knew I was going to college, but, but my mother and my father both confronted Dominic and, you know, urged him to go on that. And Dominic did tell me that, uh, that I had to go to college uh, in order to train me, never intending to ever be a professional wrestler. Was Mick Foley there with you from the start? No. No, Mick Foley, uh, th that was 1982. I graduated from high school and 82 through 86 went to Bethany. Eight, 1985, Dominic opened his school in 84. It was late 84 that I started training with Dominic and then working some independent shows. Sometime within that next year, it was around 85 that Mick, Dominic told me, because he didn't charge me uh, to train, uh, but my job was to get to the school early, unlock it, turn the heat on, clean everything up, shovel the sidewalks off in the winter, etc. And he told me, tomorrow there's a new kid coming, his name's Mickey. So I got there about six o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black and a bunch of snow had fallen. And uh, I, this old beaten up car is sitting there and it's running. But I walk up and look in and there's garbage through, all through the car. It looked like something like a homeless person living there. And I couldn't see any physical features. It was just a big mound of like hair and blanket and you know, it's all covered up. And at first I thought like somebody gassed themselves, somebody committed suicide, you know, and I knocked on the window and nothing, knocked and finally started moving and you know, pulled out and he said, are you Troy? And I said, are you Mickey? And he said, yeah, that's how we met. It was 1985 that he started coming to the Dominic School. And I'm sure you've seen the footage that he took as a film student at Dominic School when we were a lot of snot-nosed kids. So I'm guessing your first impression of him wasn't of a future world champion. Not at all, but n n nor for me. I, I mean, you know, when you when we went into training, I remember us talking about, you know, having a career. Not that either of us endeavored to. He was in film school and I was in college for for politics. And uh, at that time, as a train as a trainee, you you look at the guys on TV and you think of the guys you've grown up watching Bruno, Harley Race, Jake Roberts, Paul Orndorff, and all of these legendary wrestlers, Dominic Tanucci, and you can't envision yourself anywhere near as good as them. Uh, you know you're having trouble getting the arm dragged down or taking a backdrop. Uh, so for neither of us at any time that we were at Dominic School, do I ever remember anybody in that school thinking like, hey, we're going to go on to be a champion or even have a career in, in the business. 
And I guess your first match, you were no, known as Troy Orndorff. Uh, <laughs> Was that a name you'd had for a while, or what was the story then? No, uh, the Dominic took us to a show in Windsor, Ontario, and uh, I forget if Mick was there. I, 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 I can't specifically recall. I, I remember Dominic taking me in. He typically would take a handful of us, so I'm guessing Mickey probably was there. Uh, and Crybaby uh, uh, George Cannon was running the, the show. It was his uh, territory at the time. And we walked in. He looked at me and he said, what's your name? I said, Troy Morning. He said, that's a shit name. <laughs> he said, I don't, I don't go to the ring. I'll think of something. So he, we go to the ring and the wrestler announces, ladies and gentlemen, tonight uh, making his pro wrestling debut, the nephew of the great Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. And I'm thinking it's my opponent. Like, well, Paul Orndorff's nephew's going to be. That's pretty cool. And, and he announces Troy Orndorff. And I'm thinking, like, it took me a second to realize it was me. And uh, my first thought was, man, if Paul Orndorff hears about this, he's going to be pretty pissed. Uh, but that's how I got the name Troy Orndorff. was from uh, Crab Baby Frank, uh, George Cannon. And I understand you had a match against Randy Savage pretty early in your career. What was the deal there? Well, Dominic sent us to, a, a, he would send a band full of us, six, seven, eight of us to, to do jobs. And uh, Mickey and I, they, they, then they would do four hours of tapings in a night, a very long night. And uh, Mickey and I got used up quite often. In fact, every taping, Mickey that night, was that was by, I, just coincidentally the same night that Mickey got his jaw broken by the uh, British Bulldogs by Dynamite. Uh, my first match was with Randy Savage. I also wrestled Butch Reed that night, Harley Race, and I believe Paul Orndorff. Uh, and Mickey had a, a couple matches before he got his jaw broke. And the other guys that came up with us got paid the same thing that we got paid, but none of them worked as I recall. And uh, Dominic would send us up there every month or so to do that. I, I knew pretty early on that I didn't want to use, like the first or second match, it was under Troy Martin. But I knew I didn't want to use my real name, that if I was, if I was going to ever have a career down the road, that if I wanted to use my name. And so I started using the name Mike Kelly. Okay. And, uh, but that first night with, with Randy Savage, and there, there's a good little story about Randy with that. You know, we had seen him on television with, you know, ordering Elizabeth around and treating her like shit and everything. And uh, after the match, I went to find Randy to thank him. And uh, he was very sheepishly knocking on the door. And he's going, Liz. Liz, honey, it's me, it's Randy. <laughs> and I remember when they seen that, going, what, it's all a gimmick? It's all a work? Uh, but he was very gracious. He, he was very thankful to me. Uh, all the guys were. Butch Reed was, Harley Race was, uh, Bobby Heenan and Paul Orndorff were. And Randy said to me that night, he said, look, kid, if you ever plan on having a career in this business, never forget to thank the guy that put you over like you did for me tonight. And it always stuck with me, you know, because he was one of the, the biggest names in wrestling history, and certainly at that time. And uh, just really down-to-earth guys. You know, they, were, they, they treated me professionally in the ring, did what they had to do to get themselves over. But uh, I, I didn't get stiffed at all. Uh, the bumps were perfect, perfectly timed bumps. Uh, they were very professional with me, and, and Bobby Heenan and, and Paul Orndorff were equally as gracious. Everybody said thank you, but Paul and uh, Bobby were much like Randy in, in the first match. Did you enjoy the experience of wrestling in front of the big crowd and everything? No. no. Uh, I enjoyed working with the guys I did. But the you know when you when you walk out in a building full of ten twenty thousand people and they know you're getting chewed up, you know they, you, you, there's always a handful of people you're gonna get your ass beat you piece of shit get a boo you suck and it's just you get hit with this the whole way to and from the ring and somehow on camera you're gonna put up that excitement that you're really happy to be here. Uh, Somehow I was able to drown it out though and, and, and maintain it. You just have sort of have to cut yourself in half in your brain, you know, like from the wrestler and, and the person. And I guess the UWF would have been uh, the first major company you worked regularly for. How did that job uh, come about? Yeah, uh, that was 19, eight, late 85 or 86. Uh, Dominic Danucci had known Bill Watts. Uh, the UWF was previously called Mid South. And Bill, Bill Watts and Dominic Danucci had done a lot of work together and traveled together on the road. Bill was working to try to take the uh, Mid-South National, hence the name UWF, excuse me, to compete against Vince, 
was pretty busy. He was technically the booker, but Eddie Gilbert, his assistant booker, was doing most of the day-to-day -day work. And, excuse me, they had uh, set up with Dominic to do, because Dominic was running, you know, promoting shows in the tri-state area, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And Bill and him had set up uh, seven or eight dates. And Bill sent up, I remember it was Eddie Gilbert and Missy Hyatt, Dark Journey and Missing Link, Buddy Roberts and uh, uh, Chris Adams, Terry Taylor and Bill Irwin. It was a heck of a crew. You know, the UWF television was pretty hot at the time, especially in Pittsburgh, and uh, sent them up. And the rest of the card Dominic filled out with us as kids, his students. And Mickey and I were always the curtain jerk. He'd always put me and Mickey on first. And uh, at one of the shows in Clarksburg, West Virginia, we wrestled at the Nathan Goth Arena, uh, which was a armory, uh, the National Guard armory. Uh, when you came back to the curtain, there was a hallway, an exit door straight ahead, and two dressing rooms off to the right and left. Well, it was a hot night, and the door was open. You know, Mick and I were back there on the back patio, like behind the dressing area. And uh, Terry Taylor and Chris, uh, uh, Eddie Gilbert and Terry Taylor came out and started talking to us and said, have you guys ever thought of going on the road? Well, neither of us had. Like I said earlier, we didn't think we were good enough to do that. And he said, well, you know, I'm pretty impressed with what I see and I'd like to bring you guys to, to UWF, uh, which was, you know, incredible to us and but i still had to finish college he still had to finish college and so uh he agreed to, to contact gave his number and he said you know contact me after you guys graduate and i didn't i don't i don't know if mick did or not but it was a couple months after i graduated and i don't know how it is in canada but in the states when you borrow money to go to school you have a six month grace period after you graduate to start paying back and I was probably three, four months into mine, and the economy was had nosedived a bit, and it wasn't likely that there was going to be any uh, jobs in the, in, the, in the near future. Eddie Gilbert called me and said, uh, "You know, I'd like to give you, I'd like to bring you down, you and Mick down." And uh, he set a date with me, and I packed up and left and went. And Mickey was supposed to come in like a week or two behind me. And during that time, Bill, trying to go national, had burned up so much capital that he had to put a hiring freeze. So I had just gotten my foot in the door and they put a hiring freeze and Mickey then had to go through Memphis and, and do a different uh, route in. But uh, that was how I got my foot in the door with UWF and what a learning experience. What did you think of Bill Watts meeting him? Because he's very controversial. Yeah. Uh, if you ever heard me any, any interviews from me, you hear me mention Bill Watts a thousand times in the interviews. Uh, looking back at the time, as a kid, a young, scared kid in the dressing room, uh, he's a very intimidating guy. You know, I was about six one two oh five at the time, maybe. Bill six three six four three hundred twenty three. Big big guy. You know, his pinkies are like my thumbs, and very intimidating, imposing, a loud, boisterous, larger than life character. And uh, but th there wasn't a lot of interaction with Bill initially. You, you rarely saw him around. It's certainly not at the house shows, but at the TV tapings. The first TV taping we had. I had wrestled the first match with Eddie Gilbert, and I came, I, of course I didn't call a thing, it was Eddie calling everything. And I came back to the curtain, and I remember just having this feeling of floating, you know, like I'm finally working for a company, and I'm going to be a big star, this is great, and I came through, I'm taking my tape off, and I look straight ahead, and Bill, the dressing room door was to the right, Bill's standing there with his hands on his hips, like sort of cocked to one side, and he had that, that strange look on his face, and I, didn't say anything as I walked toward him to go past him to the dressing room. I gave him like a heads up, like, what's up? You know, I didn't say anything. I just, and I went to walk by him as I took a step into the dressing room. He goes, what the fuck was that? And I stopped dead in my tracks and in my head, I'm thinking like, is he serious? And what's he, not that I knew what a good or bad match was, but it felt like it was a good match. Eddie called it. I didn't say a thing. And uh, I quickly settled on, he's ribbing me. It's my first night. He's jacking me a little bit, you know? So I was going to look at him and say, nice rib. And I never... S you know, spoke a word or a syllable. I looked at him, I got was a smile out, and he came at me like a bear, slammed into the wall, his face right here, poking me in the sternum hard. 
And I remember, but he wasn't saying, you piece of shit, you suck, you get the fuck out. It wasn't that. But it was, don't ever turn your fucking back to the camera. If the goddamn camera doesn't see it, it means the people at home don't see it, which means you don't draw me fucking money. He was yelling specific instructions to me. And I had coaches, not that, <laughs> not that uh, assertive, but in that vein, I never liked it. But I knew, you know, what he was trying to do, teach me. Uh, very intimidating, uh, but I learned from him. And I, and I didn't know that till years later. You know, years later, I'd catch myself telling stories and I'd say, well, like Bill Watts taught me, if you don't face the camera, and, I, and I'd hear myself invoking Bill Watts' name over and over and over again. And uh, I thought, well, I must have picked something up from him. You know, it was my break into the business. And I guess that's where you started uh, using the name of Shane Douglas? Yes. Uh, when I got to Texas, I packed my little Renault Alliance up, my $111 a month car with no air conditioning, going to Texas. <laughs> and uh, packed it up with all my belongings and drove three or four days to Dallas. And uh, got there and Eddie Gilbert. I ended up living with Sting. He and his wife Sue had a, uh, Steve Borden had a, an extra room. Uh, I went to Eddie Gilbert's house to meet with him. He was married to Missy Hyde at the time. And he said, well, you want to use a stage name or not? To be honest, I didn't know what he meant. I, I, I knew what a stage name was, but I didn't know why he would even be asking me that. And he said, well, you know, if you, if you use, you know, the stage name or your shoot name, it's up to you. And I said, what's the difference? He said, well, for instance, if you use your shoot name, anybody, any Mark could call a hotel and say, is, is Troy Martin registered there? And they'll get rung right through to your room. I went, oh, no, 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 I didn't want that. I, I'm very keen on my privacy. You know, when I, it's one thing to be the franchise in front of the character or in front of the camera. But when, I, when I'm off camera, I want to be able to go read a nice book about philosophy or religion or whatever and, you know, watch a good sports or whatever. I didn't want didn't want that bleed over. And back then, previous to the to all this internet and information everywhere, if if they told you his name was Shane Douglas on TV, his name's Shane Douglas. So uh, he, I said, well, no, I definitely want to use a stage name. And he said, well, I'm thinking either Shane or Cody. And I thought about it, I said, well, I like Shane better than Cody. So he and I sat there for what seemed like hours, uh, a good long while, and Missy. We were sitting there and throwing around Troy Shane, Shane Troy, Martin Shane, Martin Troy, you know, just going through all these different incarnations. And Missy had gone into the kitchen. And I remember when you walked out of the living room into the kitchen, there was a like a wrought iron, looked like a trellis or something right there. And she walked in the kitchen and she made a tray of lemonade and she came walking around the corner with that tray of lemonade and she goes, how about Shane Douglas? And me and Eddie both stopped and looked at each other and I thought like, it sounds like it, like it goes together. It sounds like a legit name, and, uh, and that's where Shane Douglas came from. We had the Shane part, uh, but could not come up with the last part, and Missy Hyatt came up with the Douglas. Somebody tried to start heat between us. She was, um, God, this is probably around the late 80s, early 90s, before ECW. Somebody had called her and told her, somebody called me and told me, excuse me, that, uh, that I was pissed off that she was telling everybody that she created the the the, the name Shane Douglas. And to the contrary, I always told the same story I told you. You know that that it was we came up with Shane. I came up with Shane after Shane. Betty said Shane or Cody, and that she came up with the the Douglas part. And uh, then simultaneously, somebody told her that I was saying that she had nothing to do with the name or something. And like somebody, like it reminded me, like, a, like I thought if I didn't know better, I would swear Watts was doing this because it was a typical Watts, you know, coming up with that, hey, I thought you guys got along kind of stuff, but uh, it's yeah. Typical wrestling. Yeah, exactly. People like to stare up to mm -hmm. And usually with like no real reason for it. You know, it's not like, hey, if I, if I pull this on, I'm gonna make a million bucks doing it, or the company's gonna make a million bucks. I just do it to do it, you know? It's, yeah. it's just fuck with them to fuck with them. And since you mentioned Missy Hyatt, uh, we're interviewing her later today. So, uh, any particular stories or memories of her? It, just for me, like at that, because I was such a young kid at that time into the business, and my focus every night was on learning my craft. Uh, I was terrified of screwing up uh, because I had seen 
some pretty heady things. I saw uh, Bill Watts direct somebody to, to hurt a kid in the ring because the kid screwed up several nights in a row after he was screamed at and yelled at. And so I was very intimidated. If I mess up, that's what happens if you mess up. Plus, I really wanted to learn my craft. Uh, but I remember Missy being just an incredibly beautiful woman. Uh, so Dark Journey, the same thing. I mean, you know, for a young kid from, you know, bumfuck New Brighton, Pennsylvania, and here's these beautiful women on television that are standing right in front of you, but they were all very personable. The, the one thing I do remember about the UWF dressing room was that it was a pretty at ease dressing room. There wasn't, that I noticed, and maybe it was just I was young and, and naive, I didn't notice a lot of politicking. I didn't notice any backstabbing. It seemed like more like the uh, dressing rooms that I would come to know in ECW years later, cutting up everybody, you know, hey, where are you going to drink tonight? You know, that it was just like a real, like just a good old boy network. And uh, uh, Missy, the one thing that impressed me with Missy, even before I went to UWF, when they came up on that tour to, to Pittsburgh, uh, was that Missy and Dark Journey were both getting into the ring and doing things that hadn't been done before. You know, the things that we would do in ECW years later uh, to a different degree. But remember, they weren't wrestlers per se. They were valets or managers. And uh, they would always get involved in a, in a spot in the ring or uh, they were integral. Uh, Bill Watts was making the women integral. I was just a pretty face and set of tits and ass at ringside. They were integral to the match and to the storylines, a, a, a vital element to all of that, which was far different from what had been done in the wrestling business before that. I've always said in many ways, and maybe it's because of my experience in both places, but to me, the UWF was ECW before ECW came around. Like if ECW existed in 1980, four, five, six, would we have been able to get away with cut the fucking music? Probably not, and all the violence and blood. Uh, would we have, uh, my guess is we would have looked much more like UWF, heels with heat. Uh, the one thing that Bill knew was really how to get all of his talent over. Everybody on the card from the opening match to the last match, Bill and, and Eddie Gilbert worked very hard to make sure everybody meant something. It's true, Eddie Gilbert and you know uh, DiBiase and Duggan, those guys were up here and Shane Douglas was down here, but Shane Douglas was a no, wasn't a nothing. Nobody was. Everybody on the card had some semblance. In fact, my first night in, I beat uh, uh, in Thibodeau, Louisiana, that show with Bill, I beat Eddie Gilbert for the TV title. Didn't know I was, uh, but you know they, they worked hard to get us all over and we all, from my estimation, all learned our craft down there. Um, was Scott Steiner there during your time? Not that I recall, I don't think. I think it was after I was there. Because I know he, he didn't get along too well with Bill. So. Well, that was later in, in, in WCW, oh, wasn't was it? WCW. I believe so, yeah. 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 Okay. Did you ever notice uh, any of these backstage fights that happened in UWF because they were known to be a few and Bill would just let them go? Yeah, yeah. I, I was there the night that uh, Dick Slater uh, beat Sting up. Uh, I don't have so much beat him. I didn't see the actual fight. Uh, I was in the bathroom. Sting was in putting his makeup on. And I washed up and was walking out. Right as I opened the door, Dick Slater was walking in. And Dick was one of those, is one of those just, you know, casual, just go about his way guys, you know. I never had any trouble with Dick, although he's a tough old guy. Uh, stepped aside and he walked in and I walked out. And as the door was shutting, I hear, you know, hitting. And then I hear the toilet flush. And... And Dick comes walking out, and it's like, it's like he went to the bathroom and came out. You know, I didn't know exactly what happened, but you know, quickly the the story circulated around the dressing room. Uh, Bill would let things like that go on, and if somebody was getting a little bit too big for their britches, uh, Bill would book them with, you know, Slater or somebody, and say, you know, hold your own, you know. Uh, but even in its own way, and again, not that I'm advocating it, but even in its own way, you can see, especially in the world of the wrestling business where so many play, other places, the politics and things play in. Okay, if you don't like your position and you think you can take his position, then go out and take it. Uh, it has a way of teaching you a little bit of humility, uh, or you know, maybe I create a hell of a star out of it if you do go out and beat the hell out of my superstar. Um, I didn't, it wasn't like that was going on quite often though. It was, you know, here and there, you know, maybe twice or three times over the year, year and a half that I was there. And most times it was usually, 
you know, broken up within a matter of, you know, a very short time. Like in the Sting and uh, uh, Dick Slater case, it was, it was it, again, I didn't see it, but it didn't seem like it was back and forth. It was just a quick bap, bap, bapping out. Uh, but it, it definitely was not run the way I would, you know, being that my introduction to the business and thinking that's the way the business is run, then going later to the NWA and WCW and WWF, very, very differently run. You're just bringing up joining the NWA slash WCW. How did that jump happen? Uh, the, at, the, at the very tail end of the UWF, uh, we were in New Orleans. Eddie Gilbert called us, and just to show you again the nature of the business then, he called us in two separate uh, groups, heels and babies. The heels went first, so it's not to break kayfabe, and met with Eddie, and then they left. Uh, and then we went and met, and Eddie told us that the Bill Watts had had to sell the company because he had lost too much money trying to go national and was trying to recoup some of it. So at this night at UNO, University of New Orleans, they were going to have this big w, uh, NWA versus UWF show. And uh, Eddie apprised us that the plan, what the booking plan was for the NWA guys to chew up all the UWF guys, which was a bad move on Crockett's part and Dusty's part because the NWA was already on national television with TBS. The UWF fans down in that area, you know, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, those fans had much like the, the fans in Dallas grew up with the, the Von Erics, grew up with the Mid-South UWF wrestling and loved it. That was their brand of wrestling. So to come in here and say, okay, now we're going to have all these guys that you love get squashed and we're going to bring all these guys you can already get on TV and force them down your throat. Just a bad management move in my opinion. And Eddie said to us, uh, this is the plan for tonight. He didn't know who was going to be wrestling who yet, but he said this is what they're going to do. And they've already agreed to take Sting and Steiner. Uh, they were already taking them over, so they wouldn't be involved in it. But the rest of us were basically going to be fed to NWA talent. And he, Eddie told us that he had spoken to Lawler in Memphis, and that Lawler had told him that he would take the entire UWF crew lock, stock, and barrel. So the plan was we got to the building, we were all going to join up somewhere, confront Dusty, and then walk out. Uh, and, and again, you learn from all this stuff. You know, so we're all in the room waiting. Eddie calls for Dusty. Dusty, several minutes goes by. Dusty comes, opens the door, takes one step in, looks around and quickly assesses the room and says, Eddie, can I talk to you for a minute? And he pulls him out of the room and they were gone for several minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Eddie comes back in and says, uh, it's off, we're all gonna wrestle tonight. So they must have offered Eddie something to, to, to do that. But you could see in that one quick lesson with Dusty, how quickly he was able to assess the dressing room and instantly know what was going on. And cut obviously he's a master politician. Yeah, cut the snake right off the head. Eddie, come with me. Boom, we're gonna fix this. This hand, Eddie. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's the case. Maybe Missy would know more. But they must have obviously offered him something, and uh, and averted that that night. Ron Simmons and I wrestled Lex Luger and Ric Flair, and. Uh, pretty much ate us up and you know it was, it was the slaughter of the WF guys within a matter of a few months the all the stations that the NWA had gotten in the deal had dropped the NWA programming so it was you know a lot of basically uh, Crockett paid 8.4 million I think it was for a couple of ring trucks a couple of rings and you know a couple of little odds and ends other than that yeah, I think Bill Watts wrote himself in his book that it was already an out-of-business company, so he just basically yeah. worked uh, Crockett into buying it, kind of. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it was a great move for, for Bill. And, you know, I just saw Bill, ironically, a few years ago. I hadn't seen him since uh, WCW days. And, you know, Bill was always a very tense person, just always looked like a very angry person. And I saw him and he, he looked great physically. He had slimmed down, uh, but here he looked at peace, at ease. You know, and I, I walked up and said, you look fantastic. And he, how are you? It's great to see you. I mean, that was not Bill from back then, you know. Bill didn't give a shit, get the fuck out of here. Uh, so it was, it was really nice for me to see Bill and see that he's doing so well and found peace in his life, you know.
So who eventually brought you into the NWA? Was that Eddie playing a role in that? Uh, moving from UWF into the NWA, uh, originally, I believe Eddie was I implicit in it and had me show up at a taping. And within short order, Dusty had decided, they started uh, announcing that I was, had been trained by Magnum TA. In reality, I had never met Magnum at that point. Uh, I worked in, with George South and a few other people in the ring to do the belly to belly. And uh, I may be wrong on this, but I don't recall uh, Magnum and I ever doing anything on camera together. But I was brought in uh, with Eddie's help and then Dusty took a quick shine to me. And George South had later told me, just re a couple years ago, said that, uh, Dusty pulled him aside and said, we got this new kid coming in tonight. I don't want you to shine him, you know, and uh, yeah, that was his direction to George South. So it was... Uh, because for people that don't know, he was one of the regular jobbers for years and he was very skilled at, at that, I guess. Right, yeah, very good at it. And, you know, the truth be known was George was, was one of the best workers in, in the company. George just didn't want to go on the road. You know, he had a family and... and uh, he wanted to stay more close to home, and so he was able to get the best of both worlds uh, and not have to sacrifice like you do in the beginning. You know, when you go on the road in this business, as you know, it's a very difficult industry, a killer of marriages, and, you know, it's uh, really, really tough. So you eventually ended up as a tag team with Johnny Ace. Um, how did it go from you being Magnum TA's protege to uh, Johnny Ace, tag team partner? Uh, there was a point where I was sent home from the NWA, and a, a week later, I was told they were downsizing, didn't have money to send me home. A week later, they called me back and said that uh, Brad Armstrong had been fired from the Lightning Express, and they were now gonna have me and Tim Horner as the new Lightning Express. I went to Salisbury, Maryland. Tim Horner and I wrestled as the new Lightning Express in Salisbury, Maryland. And the very next day, I get a phone call and said that Brad was back and uh, they didn't need me anymore and they sent me home. And a few days after that, they brought me back again. And uh, within six months, Johnny at that time was when I, when they brought me back and, and, and even before they, uh, they sent me home, Johnny was there as the flag bearer for the uh, sheep herders. So they told me that Johnny was, was training to, to wrestle and that uh, he was going to be moving into the ring and then a short time later decided to put us together in the tag team. The ironic thing about the, the, the uh, Dynamic Dudes is that we debuted on the uh, Music City Showdown. I think it was called Music City Showdown in Nashville. It was the show where uh, Terry Funk pound yeah. drove Funk th or Flair through the table. We were the opening match on that pay-per-view uh, versus the uh, Simone SWAT team with Paul Heyman. And they announced us on air as Johnny and Shane, it was either the next generation or the new generation. And uh, it was the, you know, so we'd already aired. The next morning we get up to go to the airport and we get in the van with Eddie Gilbert who was sitting in the front seat and Johnny and I are in the second seat. And Eddie turned around and he said, well, did you hear your new name? And I'm thinking, well, we've already aired on TV, so how can we have a new name? I said, okay, I'll bite. Because Eddie had a bit of a wry sense of humor. I said, I'll bite, Eddie. What's the new name? He said, uh, well, Jim Hurd commissioned a, uh, a study in California with the philosophy that all the hip words start in California and move eastward. And, you know, the top two words were dynamic and dude. So he put them together and came with dynamic dudes. And I started laughing. <laughs> That's a good one, Eddie. And I'm laughing out loud, and Eddie stopped with a straight face and turned and looked at me. And I realized that look on his face that he was serious. I said, Please tell me you're kidding. You're ribbon. And he went, So they said, No, we were going to uh, Tri Cities. Uh, so at that point, uh, WCW had been bought, or NWA had been bought by Turner, and it was WCW. It was now transformed to WCW. Was Correct. Was the judge, okay. And, uh, they, uh, we, we, it was one of the, it was Bristol, uh, I want to say it was Bristol, it was one of the Tri-Cities in Tennessee, and I went right to Flair that night, who was the chairman of the booking committee, and I said, Rick, I said, can I talk to you, and he was laying upstairs on a, on a couch, and I said, I went into him, and I told him, he said, if this is about the name, there's nothing I can do. 
I said, well, surely you can, you're, you're the chairman of the booking committee. I said, is that not get heat with you? He said, it's a shitty name. There's nothing I can do about it. And I said, and I'm thinking in my head, like, but you're Ric Flair. You know, you're the head of the booking committee. I'm sure if you went to Jim Hurd and said, this is a bad idea, and he, he would have nothing to do with it. And so Johnny and I went and did the best we could with it. You know, we thought, well, if, rather than try to swim upstream, we'll just turn around and swim downstream and see if it works. And uh, we embraced it as much as we could. Uh, but, you know, it was, it, it's tough to get something over. When, when a wrestling fan is sitting at home and they see a team getting beat, getting beat, getting beat in all the key matches. You know, you, it's, it doesn't matter if you're going over an enhancement talent, but you're, you're with the Midnight Express and getting beat, and then with this team and getting beat, and then that team and getting beat. It's tough to get you guys over. And uh, Eddie Gilbert, uh, just to show you again how forward thinking he was, uh, said to us, you know, you, you guys uh, should turn heel. They should turn you heel and you know, have you slick your hair back and just embrace being dickheads. You know, just you know, fuck you. We're you know, we love riding our skateboards. That would have gotten a ton of heat, I think. And uh, at that time, they wouldn't do it. It shows you how quickly the business was about to change, though, because from '88, '89 frame that we're talking to '92, '93 frame, when suddenly a blonde hair, blue eyed guy could be a heel. Uh, but it was Eddie Gilbert and Bill Watts that had first seen the heels in, in us and certainly me. Did they provide the skateboards or was that up to you? <laughs> we, you know what was funny about that was they took us out on a, uh, uh, a shopping trip, you know, to, to, with the Ted Turner cards. We didn't have them, the handlers with us did. So Johnny buzzed me and he said, let's see how serious they are. Let's spend as much money as we want and see if they complain. You know, because they were telling us they were going to give us a big push, and we were the next Rock and Roll Express and all that. So we went into the skateboard, you know, who knew? In these skateboard shops, you can go and spend 100 bucks, you can spend 5,000 bucks if you want. They have all these varying levels of things. So we weren't getting one or two skateboards, we were putting seven or eight skateboards up there. And, you know, not one or two of these cheap things, we were getting 10 of these expensive things and just throwing stuff on the counter. And they just kept charging. And everyone said, no, no, no just less than that, or kept charging, charging. Charging, charging. I think by the end of the day, we spent over 5000 each and never had any blowback. Nobody ever called us today. You guys spent way too much. Uh, so that was all bought from Ted Turner. And that was, they bought that stuff so we could go out and shoot all those different vignettes. Us riding this, this you know, the water skis and the motorcycles. And uh, we spent several days going around locations all over Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and just long days you know, shooting north of the city, south of the city, heart of the city, here, there, from sun up till sundown. So, you know, pretty arduous, but you know, we, we were happy. We knew we were starting to get a push. We thought we were starting to get a push and uh, we're eager to, to pitch in in any way we could on that. And at one point uh, they had Jim Cornette managing you guys. And I guess something happened there and Jim Cornette has talked poorly about the whole angle since. Could you shed some light on that? <clears throat> yeah, they, uh, at the time, I think somebody, Stan maybe, uh, was hurt. And so they wanted to keep Jim on television, obviously. And so they had him managing us and, uh, you know, portraying it to the fans that, he, was, he had left the Midnight Express and was gonna go this route. Uh, they never told us that where it was going, but I knew there was no way they were taking Jim Cornette from the Midnight Express. It just was too hot of an entity for them for a draw. And uh, so then when they brought him back, he was managing, when, when I, I think it was Stan that got hurt, brought him back, they, he was managing both of us. And a couple of times we did some eight mans and things. And, uh, uh, I want to, I can't remember, I think it was up north, somewhere in the north that Jim turned on us and hit me with the racket. And when he did, I remember the crowd just popping, exploding, you know, like, like they were the baby faces and we were the heels. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there were any, any angles at that time in WCW that were being handled well. The booking committee, uh, in my estimation, uh, was that Ric Flair was only worrying about what Ric Flair, what it, what it implicated Ric Flair, who he was working with or whatever. Uh, 
Jim Cornette was only worried about what Jim Cornette was involved in, and nobody was taking the time to look at the overall picture. You know, in a, in a successful promotion, this angle has to seamlessly move into this angle, which has to seamlessly move into the next, and the next, and the next. Instead, it was just sort of like, this block is Jim Cornette's block, and this block is Ric Flair's block, and this block is whoever's block. Uh, the committee just, it didn't, it never, in my estimation, worked. And uh, I recall watching the show at that time that after Dusty had left and they were going to this uh, booking committee, the show suddenly took on a feel of uh, like, a, like it had stepped back. You know, like it, it didn't have that, that compelling element to it anymore, in my estimation, watching as a fan. And finally about Johnny Ace, uh are you surprised that he ultimately ended up with a pretty good position in WWE and I think he's still pretty high up there these days? No, not at all. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Johnny was uh, an educated guy. It, ironically, he and I both grew up in towns called New Brighton. Him in New Brighton, Minnesota and me in New Brighton, Pennsylvania. Uh, we were both educated and we we knew that how the business was run. And, uh, like much like I did, I, I was a guy that always paid attention. Like, why is the camera guy shooting like that? Why did the director just cut from camera two to three in that? And why did they? Why did the booker put this guy over on that guy? And I was always in, ingesting all parts of it. You know, there are guys in dressing room. Hey, did you see the beautiful girl in the third row? And I'm thinking, like, no, I was paying attention to the shoot. You know, I was paying, paying attention to the direction. And. Uh, Johnny was very similar to that. Johnny was constantly having ideas. We'd be driving down the road and Johnny would say, you know, what they're doing with the road warriors, I would have done this instead of that. And then we'd bounce it back and forth and talk about it. So you could tell that Johnny really had a head on his shoulders for delving beyond just who's winning and who's losing. And uh, I remember Johnny vividly, he used to say it's quite often in fact, he used to say, you know, one of these days you and I are going to be running the industry, and when we get up there, it's going to, we're going to run, we're going to do things differently, and uh, not that ever any of us ever said we're going to be the number two guy at the WWE or uh, ever book any place, but you're just doing the natural progression of things. You're not going to wrestle forever, and when you move past that, we become an agent, uh, a writer, a promoter, a booker, whatever. Uh, Johnny always seemed to have that uh, to me. Um, I don't know if he would say the same thing back. Uh, I, I'm guessing he would uh, because the two of us were very like-minded in that way. Did you ever have any dealings with him in later years? I know you never went back to WWE, uh, but was there ever any talks in the days when he was in charge? No. Uh, he, uh, I, mean, we, I saw him, I took my, at the time Connor was six, so this is 10 years ago, give or take. Uh, they had the last show ever in the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. Not that I wanted to go to a WWF show. I, it, it, you know, it's no secret to the fans. It's not my cup of tea. It's not my. I love seeing guys wrestle and counter and take down. You know, the the flippity flop stuff. That's just acrobatics to me. It's like a dance. Uh, but my son who at that time was still into wrestling and you know had all the action figures and the WWE video games and everything. He had been to wrestling shows before, but I don't think he'd ever been to a WWE show and they were tearing the Pittsburgh Civic Arena down. Now that was the building that I grew up watching wrestling in that my dad had taken me to wrestling in. So I took Connor just so that I could say, show him the building that my dad, his granddad had taken me to. And it was just sort of like a more of a family lesson to my son. And we walked in, uh, I'd called Joey Styles and gotten tickets. Uh, Johnny didn't even know I was going to be there. I walked in and very quickly ran into him and we talked to him, but he was busy as you can imagine, a TV taping and he was running around. Uh, we said hello, spoke briefly and that was it. Uh, uh, we had not spoken since I tried to call him one time, probably shortly after that, just to catch up, like, hey, we got a chance to run into each other, let's follow up and you know, reconnect and uh, never got a call back. Uh, it seems like uh, you would have been a good producer or agent for WWE, so I'm surprised they never reached out to you in that capacity, if you would even have been interested. Well, remember, when I, you know, Vince, like for all the fans that are saying like, there's like this rumor online that Bam Bam Bigelow is getting inducted, and I hope he is. Uh, he certainly would deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. But the fans are, you know, on Twitter, you know, hitting me up and on Facebook saying, you know, you, you ought to be the one to induct him. Uh, 
uh, I think it would be appropriate. You know, Bam Bam and I had a pretty pretty good and long connection in wrestling with a triple threat. But if you go back and remember the history of the relationship between me and Vincent Mann, it was far from yeah, the best. Which I uh, get into. <laughs> but to end off this run in WCW, uh, what led to you leaving at that point? Well, we were making decent money. You know, not great money, but you know, for a, a kid uh, at the time, I was probably in my mid to, to late twenties. Didn't have a bill, and, and you know, my my rent payment was like two hundred and thirty bucks a month or something. At home, I was never there. I was just someplace to drop my bags. I I had a substantial amount of money saved, and uh, there was a point where it came. We were at a television taping in Baton Rouge. Trying to just recall the, the specifics. Uh, I had been off with uh, I had uh, some uh, blood clots on my knee and, and a few you know, tears in my knee and had to be off for three or four weeks. And the entire time that I was off, Jim Ross, who was on the booking committee, kept calling me. And other people on the committee kept calling me at home and saying, hey, as soon as you can get back, we really need you back. And they talked, I remember specifically them all talking very, very badly, negatively about Sting and Luger. Uh, these uh, these son of a bitches make all this money. They, don't, they, they, they cry about everything. They're, you know, just really negatively. <laughs> and they told me then that they were splitting me and Johnny up and were gonna give me a big singles push. So we get back, I get back on the road, go to Baton Rouge, my first day back in a month, three weeks, a month, whatever. After these weeks of phone calls about this singles push, and uh, I go to catering and sit, you know, sit my tray down, and Missy Hyde had just come out of the, promote, uh, the uh, booking meeting, and she got her train, she came over and asked, she could sit with me and she sits down and she goes, Shane, I don't want to start anything, but they were really talking badly about you in that booking meeting. And I'm thinking like, I just got back. How can they be talking negative? So I'm, in my head, I'm thinking maybe Missy got mixed up on something. They were talking about Sting and Luger or whatever. So, but it, it piqued my interest. So I, I left to go find Jim Ross and uh, Halfway down the hallway towards where Jim Ross's office was, I ran into Teddy Long, who was just a referee at the time and had just started managing Mark Callis. He had a clipboard, like a like it was a boss or something. And Mark Callis was there with him, and he stopped and said, "Okay, uh, Shane, tonight in segment three or four, whatever the number, uh, you're gonna be working with uh, me and Mark here. Uh, three or four minutes, he'll take it with the heart punch." I went, no, that's not what I mean. I said, I'll be happy to put him over, but that's not what I was told. And he goes, well, that, that's what you'll do or, or, or you know, like it or leave it. And I said, well, we'll find out. And I went to find Jim. I went down and I found Jim and I explained to him what Teddy had just said and reminded him what he had told me in these phone calls over the last month. And he said, no, 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 that stupid SOB has it all wrong. And he said, go find Jody Hamilton. He'll, he'll tell you. So I searched the building for Jody Hamilton, and when I walked into the building, it was like in the Baton Rouge Centroplex, uh, the dress rooms were all like the old, you know, like Hollywood days. They have the lights around oh, okay. the mirrors and you know, the little table in front, you know, the, the partition off the wall for the counter. <coughs> and I walked in the door, and I'd say if I'm Jody Hamilton looking into the mirror, I walk in over here, and he won't even look at me. He doesn't even turn to address me. He just keeps going like this writing. And I said, well, you know, I'm getting this, you know, was told this in these phone calls. Missy Hyde told me that. Teddy Long told me this. Jim Ross told me that. This way, this way, this way, this way. What? Give me the lowdown. He threw his pencil down. Still never looked at me. He threw his pencil down. And he said, you'll do the goddamn job to Mark Callis in two or three minutes with the heart punch, or you can get your ass the fuck out of here. Okay, he watched me get my ass the fuck out of here, and I threw a garbage can at him, you know, garbage at him. I was like, fuck you. You know, I'd had it at that point of the politics. I had tolerated it. At this point, I'd been around the business for six, seven, eight years, and had coming from the UWF was not used to that kind of shit, and had tolerated it and tolerated it and tolerated it. To this day, I can't understand what the weeks of phone calls were to my house. You know, like, like it's one thing to sit there and say, let's play a rib on so-and-so. It's another to say, it's sort of demented to say, let's call him for weeks on end and tell him something and then get him here and do this to him. <coughs> to me, if that's what you wanted from me, yeah, I'm under contract. If you'd have called me and said, 
hey Shane, we come back, we're gonna split you and Johnny up, we're gonna job you out for a little bit and then start with no harm, no foul. You know, was, uh, to be clear so everybody understands, you know, I was never really the world champion. And when somebody beat me, they never really were beating me either. It was a work. It's like an acting job. Exactly. If the director tells me to take a bullet and die, I take the bullet and die. And uh, But what upset me at that time then, and, and, and always has, is the absolute lack of ability of being a man. To look you in the eye and say, this is what we want you to do. Lie to you, lie to you, lie to you, lie to you, lie to you. Then try to play tough guy with you. And I remember as I was walking out, you know, I grabbed my bags and was leaving. And uh, Tom Zank, who sadly just passed away, Brian Pillman, who sadly died, passed away several years ago, and Johnny Ace, stopped me in the parking area and they said, look, you know, you walk out, they're gonna fire you, you're gonna lose your contract. So guys, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm so far past this boy, I'd had it like up to here, you know. And uh, uh, Wahoo McDaniel, Came out and goes, kid, kid, and he stopped me. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? And I told him, he goes, ah, oh, you don't want to do that, kid, because you know you're gonna burn a bridge. And I said, well, I have no disrespect to you, but I don't give a fuck about burning the bridge. I don't give a fuck if I'm not in this business anymore. But at that time, what they didn't know is I'd been talking, not behind their backs. I was talking to Pat Patterson just as a, a connection in the business, a contact. I'd never once asked him for a job. I'd never once asked him, hey, will there be a prospect for a job? It was just, hey, can you give me some advice? That kind of thing. And uh, I got to, the, to Baton Rouge Airport to fly home and all flights connected through Atlanta to Pittsburgh. So while I was in Atlanta for my connection, I had like a couple hour layover, I called Eddie Gilbert to tell him what was going on. Because at this time we were hearing, you know, again, you could never get a straight answer from anybody, but we were hearing rumors that what the office would want in Atlanta would be disseminated in the field at the tapings, and then the politics would take place there. Right. Was it still heard running it in Atlanta at that time? Yeah, it was still heard running it, but running it like on a corporate, more like the C CEO, Right. Uh, Eddie Gilbert was more involved in the booking in the office. He he was no longer going out to the to the tapings. Joey so, Hamilton was on the booking committee, I assume. Yes, and I wanted to make sure before I did walk out of the company, I wanted to make sure that this we'll find out for myself was the office aware of this because were these phone calls about me getting this big singles push was that legitimate coming from the office and now somebody out in the field pulling something else and I called Eddie Gilbert and Eddie said yeah don't don't fly to Pittsburgh tonight go check into the hotel go see Jim Hurd in the morning and you know make sure you clear everything with him so I went the next morning I waited for him to come in he came in about an hour late and uh, I expected to have, you know, a fairly intelligent conversation with the guy. And instead, he starts talking down to me and saying, uh, at one point we go into his office, he keeps on telling me, I'm making a big mistake, I'm making a big mistake. He never clarified what I was making the big mistake about, but then he said, I'm gonna show you something. And he's leafing through his drawer and he pulls out a piece of paper and he hands it to me. And I reach for it, he pulls it back and he goes, now before I give this to you, I'm gonna let you know, you probably won't be able to understand it being that you're a wrestler. <laughs> I got two fucking master's degrees, you jackass. I can understand anything on this goddamn desk. And I looked at it and he starts explaining, that, sadly, the, the dumb wrestler that couldn't understand it, understand it keenly well, he didn't understand it. They had the WWF rating, and then they had, at that time, there were still like Portland, Memphis, Dallas, uh, there were still a handful of, in the, you know, the smaller territories. He had taken, and he had these two numbers circled. The numbers that he had circled was the WWF rating versus all of these ratings combined. So Portland added with Memphis, added with Dallas, added with this one and this one and this one. And they still lost by like three tenths of a percentage point. Was WCW included in that? What well, was the WCW number? Uh, I believe it was. Yeah, so they would have been with all the combined. Yeah, so they, and his, his argument at that time was, see, so we're not that far behind. And I said, no, if you circle this number and this number, you'll see your, your light years behind. And at that point, it was clear to me that if this is the guy running this company, it's no wonder what's happening out in the field is happening. And they haven't got a chance of competing with WWF. And that's when I left and I, going, I went to the airport before I got on my plane to fly to Pittsburgh. I called Pat and Pat said, call me Monday morning, we'll talk then. That's how I got my foot in the door from 1990 to go to WWF. 
so I guess uh, in WWF you would have did you have to have a tryout or were, did they automatically give you right into the mix? No, uh, no tryout. Um, I went straight to the uh, to the first taping. I had no guarantee of spot. It wasn't like I was coming in as the franchise Shane Douglas or whatever, or even the dynamic dude Shane Douglas. It was just Shane Douglas. Uh, I was given a mid card position. I wasn't getting beaten on a night, nightly basis. I wasn't winning on a nightly basis. It was just, I was sort of there. But I remember my 1990 stint there. I was there for about a little over a year. I enjoyed it. I really had fun. I was working with guys like Jake Roberts and Haku and, you know, some pretty talented guys. Uh, occasionally I'd slide them over. Uh, or, like, I remember me and Haku, we did Broadways quite often. And. 15 minute Broadways? Yeah, and I remember thinking to myself, even even letting, giving me that, going toe to toe with this guy for 15 minutes is a hell of a start for me. A lot better than what I was getting there. And uh, I made decent money. I didn't get rich, but I made comparable to what I was making in WCW under contract. Uh, and enjoyed it. I, I had a, a good time there in 19. I can't say anything negative about the WWF or Vince at that time. Now, I was a pretty big fan of it back then and I don't recall any vignettes of you before you made your debut. What Were there any done? In the WWF? Yeah. No, but Vince wanted to, I used to play bass guitar and sang and wrote music. At that time, Vince wanted, uh, I remember him sitting in his office and you know, looking me up and down and had different sketches for, for outfits and uh, he wanted to, what he told me was he wanted to create a legitimate rock star. You know, somebody who was out on tour making and, and you know, doing that industry and then coming back and, and doing much more what he would do years later, like with The Rock or, you know, uh, Jer Jericho with music. And uh, uh, they had Jimmy Hart. Uh, I went to the Pittsburgh before I went on the road. They came to the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. I went and met with Jimmy Hart. And he had three or four songs written in three or four versions, like a bubblegum version, a rock version, a heavy metal version. Uh, and we sat in the back with just a little recorder, like a little machine, and he'd play the music and I would sing to it. And uh, he said, well, I think you're more in this range. And he'd like rewrite the, the notes to the song. One was American Girls, another one was called Rockin' Down the Halls. And I can still remember the, the line uh, to uh, Rockin' Down the Halls. It was, uh, me and my boys, uh, me and my boys are going rocking down the hall. Uh, we're doing what we want because we're skipping study hall. Uh, it was uh, something like corner along that line. But you know, the, the, the music that Jimmy had written had a good hook to it. And I, and I thought to myself, if they allow some interaction and, and back and forth, I could probably do this. And that's when the girls came up with the, if you remember the outfit that had the, the leather straps and the denim and the, yeah. the tearaway pants. Uh, that the, the seamstress girls had made and right as that all started coming together is when my dad came down with uh, latter stage emphysema and Vince and I had a long talk and it was either Niagara or ear I want to say it was Niagara and I told him what was going on and he told me family always comes first he 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 put this glowing story on the table about his mother uh, my mother's my hero she took care of us on and on and on so you can imagine my surprise years later when I read in Playboy magazine the accusations uh, but he said to me that the door was always open for me to come back I'd been a great employee go home take care of your father and good or bad outcome when you're ready to come back just give me a call so it was your choice to leave and Basically, they just brought you in as an extra hand to do whatever job was available. Right. But they liked what you did and they were about to give you a gimmick, but you took the family option. Exactly right, yes. Okay. And I'm guessing uh, you stayed with your father uh, till the end. and. Yeah, that was 91. That was, uh, well, it was December when that happened because it, I remember I had to get a job. To, that's my first teaching job. Uh, that, that started back in January when the kids came back. That was January. My dad passed away in August of 93, so a couple years. 
Now, when you were a teacher at that time, did the kids know you from TV? Initially, they didn't because the first two years that I taught, the kids that I were teaching were special ed kids. Uh, and so they were, you know, not not they weren't into wrestling, but thankfully I hadn't been a big star on WWF sh uh, television, so they don't not only they ever put two and two together. You know, I didn't dress anything like that. I had my hair pulled back in a ponytail, <coughs> wore my glasses and things, and the kids never really put two and two together. A couple kids did. The second year that I taught, I remember some kids came, uh, and they had a picture that was taken during a vignette shoot, where. Uh, you know, I, my shirt was half pulled open. And there were some pretty women around me and things. And, you know, I took it from you know, the, the morality clauses like they have in these ridiculous morality clauses that they have. You know, the, my morality is better than your morality. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, as stupid as it sounds, I can get you fired as a teacher. Uh, because God knows playing, you know, having a risque picture of you with pretty women having your shirt half unbuttoned must have meant that you did something, uh, <laughs> you know, illicit. So it's... Uh, but yeah, it wasn't until years later, when I, especially when I started in ECW in 93, that the kids really started putting two and two together. Because I can imagine that might cause some issues just with disciplining them and so keeping them focused. You'd be surprised. Uh, you know, when I went to school, if I'd had a 253 pound uh, f former champion wrestler as a teacher, I'd have been mortified to say anything back to them. I, I was, you know, I, back then teachers could slam your head off a ball and did mine several times. But the kids by that time had been uh, learning that, you know, the old, old saying, the inmates running the asylum. Uh, the kids had learned at that time, you can't say, you can't raise your voice to me, you can't touch me, you can't this, you can't that. So the kids would come in, not many, but there was always that kid that thought he was going to make a point, you know, because he didn't think you could do something to him. And what he didn't realize was that there were certain other ways to handle things that, you know, maybe cut a corner here or there that, uh, you know, somebody doesn't see something, uh, your word against mine type of thing. Um, I only ever had to do that one time. I pulled a kid into the faculty bathroom after he had made threats against another student. And I made my point to him a little more clearly than I would typically in a classroom. It was astounding how he got it. Uh, keenly understood what I was trying to convey to him and did not harass that student later. This student, by the way, was a student who had uh, been uh, perfectly healthy till she was five years old, was hit by a car and had head, head trauma. So she had a brain injury. And uh, I won't say her name, but she was a, I enjoyed her in class uh, because she tried. And uh, she was a little bit heavy set and uh, the, if I asked the question before I'd even finished the question, her hands going up. Who was the first? You know, what was it? You know, her, and half the time she'd nail it. She'd get it right. And the other half, she could have been more wrong, you know. But she was trying, and that's all I wanted from my kids. When she would miss a question, these other kids, especially this kid I'm talking about, they, they would call her jelly bean. And it was a negative term to her, and we'd get her wound up and riled up. And, and I warned them about it, I threatened them about it, and then finally this kid said something in class of what he was going to do to Jelly Bean. Let me talk to you for a second. And, you know, it just, you know, my sense of fairness to people, you don't treat people like that. And, you know, you certainly don't make fun of somebody that has that kind of a, you know, handicap to overcome. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of these kids didn't see that. And the way the system, the, from my estimation, the way the system was set up, it was protecting kids like that. And in my estimation of this or that, then endangering this student, because you can imagine within a year or two, and this girl's old enough to quit school, will she rather sit here with these other jackasses and keep getting called names yeah. or, or quit and leave? And I'd much rather invest time and resources into her than the jackasses. So surprisingly, after what you just told us about your first experience in WCW, you went back to WCW in 92. What led to that? Uh, I was teaching uh, the, at the time, the, 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 I wasn't teaching for a school district. I was teaching for an entity called the BVIU, the Beaver Valley Intermediate Unit. In Pennsylvania, the laws had just changed. Special education was all umbrellaed in the county under one entity. So in, in this case, Beaver County uh, Intermediate, Allegheny County Intermediate Unit, whatever county, Butler County Intermediate Unit. I was hired by the Beaver Valley Intermediate Unit to teach uh, socially emotionally disturbed kids called emotional support now. And they had had uh, 
the state was trying to downsize uh, ultimately what the state did was what had happened they wanted to move that into the school district because it was then cheaper for the state so they kept cutting the budgets and cutting the budgets and what that meant was they were cutting uh, number of teachers number of teachers number of teachers and I was the low man on the totem pole because I was the last in one of the last in the good thing for me was nobody wanted that class uh, those were the tough kids that would fight and you know they, they weren't uh, cognitively impaired they were just behaviorally impaired kids and uh, so most of the especially women teachers that taught for the BVI you didn't want that classroom so I was safe for most of that first year by the end of the second year there had been so many cuts and downsizing that now my job was in threat you know it was very unlikely that I was gonna be called back the next year so uh, at that time Marty Gennetti called and we reconnected because he and I had done some things in 90 as the new rockers when Sean was off with a knee injury and uh, he said that he had he had spoken to Kip Fry who was running uh, WCW at the time and that he had gar gotten him to guarantee us four thousand dollars a week to go back as the new rockers and I thought well there's pretty likely that this job will be gone and step right into that right after this job is done this at the end of this school you're perfect and, and after I put my notice in with the BVIU that I was leave, definitely leaving, uh, Marty had that incident where a girl ended up dead at a party at his oh, house. Yeah. And Kip Fry rescinded the offer immediately, but I had already signed with them. So I was already stuck going in, had no other job, so I thought, well, it's going to ride this out and see where it goes. Uh, I went, and uh, it was just a single there for a while. Uh, and then... Bill Watts had the idea of putting me and Ricky Steamboat together. Oh, so when you came back, it was Kip Fry running the uh, office part and Bill Watts was the booker? I, I may be wrong on this, but I believe Kip Fry is who I signed or agreed to return with for no specific money. It was a nightly. And then he was either let go, quit, was fired, whatever. When I, by the time I'd got there, Bill Watts was now running it, which I thought was good for me because I knew that I'd had this relationship with Bill before. I knew Bill liked my work. Um, I'd always been respectful of him. And uh, so I, I thought at least it's a, a more positive thing. I didn't know Kip Fry from Adam. I'd never met him other than talk to him on the phone. And uh, so when I learned that Bill Watts would be taking over, I thought that, I, that can only be good for me. How was Bill in WCW compared to uh, Mid-South? Was he uh, as intimidating to everyone as he was there with the corporate company? It tried to be uh, in some ways, not as, as overt as he had been, but uh, I remember one night we were in uh, center stage and I'd always gotten along fantastically with Rick Root. You know, I'd, I'd always gotten along with most everybody in the dressing room. And Bill called me into his, into his office and he said, I, I thought you and, because at the time we were angled with Vader and Root. And he said, uh, I thought you and Rick Root got along. So we do, why? He said, well, you didn't hear this from me, but he's really been talking, showing you telling me you're fucking the matches up. And, you know, at first, I, like, that doesn't sound like rude because Rude's the kind of guy that comes straight to you, you know? Yeah. Hey, you're right. fucking up, kid. And, uh, but I remember, like, I, for a second, I caught myself thinking, like, why would Rick say that? And then I started thinking about it afterwards, and I went to Ricky, and Ricky goes, Pfft. well, then I found out from Rude that he had gone to Rude and said the same thing to Rude in an old promoter's trick so that you don't, you know, because we were starting to have pretty good, good matches, me and Steamer against him and Vader. This way, you keep from at each other's throats instead of going in and asking for more money. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, and Ricky pointed it out to me, and I, I just knew it wasn't Rick because Rick was a pretty, pretty in your face guy. If he had something to say to you, he would definitely say it to you. Um, but once we, you know, talked, that it never went any place. But that just, to me, seemed to be beckoning back to Bill Watts playing the same type of games that he had before. How was working with Vader? Snug. Uh, I, I wouldn't say stiff. Um, you know, he when it was his time to get his, he took it. But he also would give you yours. You know, he, you know, to have you move, fire up on me, roll over and tag Ricky. So it wasn't like he just ate me up and then get Ricky and Ricky did all the, the superstar stuff. Both Leon and Rick uh, were very professional with me and, and helped teach me in that time that, that I was with Ricky and we were angled together. Was it uh, Bill Watts that paired you with Ricky? Yes, uh, he came to me at, at, uh, when I first got there, and remember I'd gone on a nightly, 
I had no guarantee after the, the Kip Fry thing and, and with uh, Marty had fallen through. And he said, uh, I can't get, you know, the money's tight. I can't, they're, they're cutting you know, budgets everywhere, which is one of the reasons why I think Fry left. And uh, if, if I'm recalling correctly, it was because Kip Fry was giving out these big dollar contracts to everybody. And so the company came back and said, we're gonna really pull this in. And he said, if you can if you can commit to me, Shane, just one quarter, work one quarter, I'll guarantee you 300 bucks a night, show me in that first quarter that you've got something to offer the company, and I promise you second quarter we'll get you a contract. Well, keep in mind, I'd been off the road for over two years. So I thought, well, that's only fair. It's not like I've been hot on TV last month or six months ago. So as long as I can make, you know, pay my, cover my road expenses, that, that's fine. So I, I agreed to that. It was in that first quarter that he put me with Ricky. Uh, he had had Ricky with Dustin for a short while, and uh, I can't recall the specifics as to why he just came. I, I, I'm pretty sure that he knew that I still had to learn how to be a main eventer, how to make a comeback. I still I was a great seller and, and had good fire, but I didn't know how to make a really good prolonged comeback. Uh, didn't know how you know to be a, to work a main event. Uh, to me, every match on the card was the same, and. Uh, so Ricky at that time was available, and I think getting to that point, he was probably like in his mid to late forties. Not that he was in bad shape; he was in, he's still in phenomenal shape. But I think that they thought, for his sake, put him with somebody that can take the bumps and you know give him a little more longevity. And Ricky and I really hit it off. You know, we were, you know, we became very, very good friends, uh, kindred spirits. We were very, you know, neither of us were big drinkers or didn't take drugs or anything. Um, so uh, that put us together and, and we started the gel pretty quickly. Uh, Ricky was such a professional. You know, most people in that position would say, well, I'm working with this, this young kid, so, you know, shine me up and then get the heat on Shane and I'll make the comeback. To the contrary, Ricky was the exact opposite. See, at that time, I didn't like to make comebacks. Uh, I was, got nervous and, you know, hesitant and, you know, froze up a little bit. And uh, I would think the heat would be on me tonight. And I'd be on the apron, we'd be doing our ins and outs, and all of a sudden Ricky would take some kind of big bump and he'd sit up and say, I got gotcha, you, partner. And he'd, I'm feeling like, oh, fuck, now I gotta make a comeback tonight. You know, I'd get all worried. And so that's how gracious Ricky was. And, and every night we'd be in the car and he'd say, hey, tonight when you did this and this, and that was okay. But what if you'd have done this before that spot and then come out of it and done this? And I'd be looking out the, in the dark of the night and rolling that through. I could see it in my head like a movie. And I'd be seeing what he was saying. I'd be like, yeah, that, that, would, that would be awesome. That'd be incredible. Why didn't I think of that? And that's how it was every night with Ricky. Ricky was never one to say, man, you shit the bed today. Even when you did shit the bed, he'd come in and say, that yeah, was okay, but... And then he'd take it another way and uh, really started you know, connecting with Ricky. Bill Watts called me to his office somewhere right around the end of that first quarter. And he said, uh, you know, at that time we had, we'd go down every, I think it was Tuesday or Thursday and cut the promos downstairs at the CNN Center. And they would insert them into the shows. He said, I've been watching your promos, Shane. He said, anybody ever told you you're a goddamn stone cold heel? And other than Eddie saying at that time with the dynamic dudes, I said, no, not really. And uh, he said, well, you are. And he said, uh, what do you think about turning heel on Ricky and working the program with Ricky Steamboat? Well, who wouldn't love to work a program with Ricky Steamboat, right? I mean, the, you know, one of the greatest baby faces of all time. But as I started thinking about it sitting in his office, I thought, well, it's, it's still... I'm, in my head, and I'm short of the fans, it was still Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas. It, we weren't anywhere near this even. It was still, a, I still had a lot to learn from him. And I said, I thought about it for about 10, 15 minutes. And I said, boy, Rick, or, or Bill, as much as I would love to work with Rick, I just don't think the fans would buy it. And he said, why not? And I said, because I don't think I'm anywhere near his level yet. And he sat back in his chair and put his hands behind his head and said, you know, uh, I always knew you would be the one that, that, that picked this business up. And then that's when they came up with Brian and, and uh, Steve for the Hollywood Blondes. So it still worked out for us because we had an incredible team to work with off of it. But that, the original inception of the Hollywood Blondes was to be me and Brian Pillman. Oh, okay. That would have been quite something, actually. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people remember that feud in uh, WCW from that time. I certainly do as a fan of WCW. Um, what are some of the highlights of that feud for you? Oh, my God. It was, it was fun. 
it was just fun. Um, you know, I, I see kids today, you know, in the back and say, okay, we'll do this and we'll do this and then we'll do this. And they go over and over and over and over and over and over and over it. We never spoke. You know, if, if we spoke before and it was me, the only person that would speak would be Ricky. He would say, okay, why don't we do something tonight where we work the leg spot? And then like just a, just a general outline of go home. And the rest was done on the ring. And Brian and Steve's timing was so impeccable. You know, that I used to do the spot where he would beat me up and shoot me, the Irish would me to the other turnbuckle. And I would do a blind turnaround uh, cross body. Well, when you do that, you can't stop and you can, but then it, it loses some of the impact of the move. Every time you do it, no matter who you're doing it with, there's always like you're not, your stomach you knots up a little bit. Like, I hope they're there, you know, because you're going blind. Austin, every night I would do that with Austin, he wasn't just in the perfect spot. He was in the perfect spot. He would hit it perfectly, come up off of it perfectly, sell it perfectly. And it just, you just got to a real comfort zone with Brian and Steve because you knew that they were so fluid on their end. The only thing that made tough working with them was that they would get a little bit wrapped up too much into it uh like the one night in detroit they had beaten me and you know ricky and i had gone over on them and they beat us down afterwards and the the out on the match was or, or on that segment was to be to take our titles and lay them on our chest like okay you may be the champion but we just whooped your ass and leave instead they both get wound up and uh steve was with uh, uh steamboat and brian was with me taking they threw the belt the belt busted me and busted my lip open and chipped ricky's tooth and i remember watching brian and steve look, walk down the the stairs and walking back and we're, we should still be laying out and selling ricky looks at me and he rolls over and he goes let's go partner and he jumped right up and he shot down the stairs like 15 feet behind brian and steve and it was the only time i'd ever seen ricky lose his cool he's gonna look at my partners look look at my fucking tooth and he, you know it was uncalled but that was because brian and steve were inhabiting their characters they were really living that character which bled through on on camera uh, uh, no surprise that Steve went on to what the greatness that he became in the business, the, you know, what he ascended to. And I have no doubt that Brian Pimmel would have done similar had he not passed away at, so, at such a young age. Do you think WCW dropped the ball with that tag team because they were really over? Yeah. Again, the politics in, in WCW were, were as more its undoing than, 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 look, let's face it, dealing with wrestlers and prima donnas I can be a real pain in the neck. But there's also an awful lot of money involved in it. Look, just go ask Vince. Uh, but especially when Time Warner took over. Ted Turner was the was the impetus behind pro wrestling being on on TBS and TNT and all the Turner properties. When Time Warner took over, they there was almost today they would call it the elitists. You know the the elites didn't the elites that were running. WCW Time Warner didn't think they, they thought they were above pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is for the rednecks and those people down there. Uh, I remember Diana Myers, who was the lead attorney for WCW. She was vocally pissed off that these wrestlers were making more money than her. And how could that be? She had a law degree, and we were just nasty old wrestlers, you know. Well, if she wanted to come on the road with us anytime and do what we did, she's more than welcome to and probably could have made a better paycheck. Uh, the, the, the reality was we were drawing more money. and uh, But that was the attitude. Time Warner didn't really want wrestling on. And so if you don't really want, you know, that, that, you know, piece of furniture over in the corner, you get rid of it. And uh, it was pretty clear that when they took over that f from the time Time Warner took over that WCW became sort of like the redheaded stepchild. And so I've often said in interviews, the only time that Vince in, in, the, in the battle between WCW and WWF ever really had competition was at the very outset of that when Turner was still in control, which was the very small portion of that time. And then once Time Warner took over, Vince, in my estimation, has never had real competition. ECW, as hot as it got, we weren't a pimple on his ass. We were a tiny little company, and although we had a great fan base, but we still were nowhere near being able to compete on a night-to-night -night basis with WWF on a corporate level. Uh, WCW wasn't. TNA, although they had all the resources, never were. And so there's been all these false starts, and I think as a result, Vince McMahon has gotten a bit complacent. And, and believing that nobody can compete with them, which is a fallacy.
And now he appears to even be bored with his own product. <laughs> yeah. At all the wrong time, right? But you know, we were talking about this on the way, just to take a little sidebar here. Uh, it, it, from all appearances to me, it, it looks like a shit idea, right? To try to start. I mean, regardless of the, the ratings decline and everything else, the, the, the NFL, like the movie Concussion said, still owns a day of the week. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the ratings decline and you look, like I just watched uh, the, the Patriots Jaguars game. And as somebody who's been watching football for all my life, I kept asking, because I hadn't watched a full game in a couple of years. I kept asking my buddy, why, why was that a flag? Or why was that hit against Gronkowski? Why was that a penalty? And why wasn't that a touchdown? And why'd they blow the whistle? Like, I didn't know the game anymore. I'm watching a game I've watched all my life, and I couldn't understand it. Uh, I think that the NFL has gotten so politicized. I don't know if you saw this week, they just turned down an ad from a veterans association and refused to run it. Wouldn't, you know, they wanted to buy an ad and they wouldn't sell it to them. Uh, there, there's a lot of people in, in America that are just pissed off about the politics and, you know, the, like in my case, the, the so many rules changes that it's not, it doesn't seem like football anymore, uh, that starting a new league in two years, if the NFL continues doing what they're doing next year and we see a similar decline, which I don't see why it would turn around, two years from now, people might be saying Vince McMahon's a genius again. <laughs> it's, it's, uh... Crazy, but I, I think the last thing the WWE right now needs is for him to take his eye off of it and doing anything else. It needs a lot of help right now. I agree with you on that. Um, even though I'm not even inclined to watch it at all. <laughs> you and me both. What's happening? Um, so you left WCW, I guess. So what happened? Uh, it was a, it was only about a year or so stint this time. Uh, yes, uh, Ricky and I. Uh, we, I, I worked through the first quarter at 300 a night. Uh, Brian and Steve were making six figures. Ricky was making a strong six figures, and I was making 300 bucks a night. So I went back to Bill the second uh, quarter, and I said, uh, Bill, remember our deal? And he said, oh, Shane, I, I'm so sorry. He said, they just cut the budget again, and gives me, gives me this song and dance if I would just please hang in there for one more quarter, and on and on. Well, what am I gonna do? You know, walk out in the middle of a title run? Uh, so I looked at him and I said, Bill, I will give you one more quarter, but next quarter, if there's no new contract, uh, th accept that as my notice right now. So I worked th through the next quarter, and had never told Brian, Ricky, or Steve what I was making, and it was any of their business. But you have to admit, it was a big chip on my shoulder each night. You know, I'm going out, and these guys are making a lot of money, and I'm one quarter of this match, and I'm making pennies. Uh, then, right at the end of that second quarter, Bill Watts gets fired, and Ole Anderson comes in. So I went to Ole, and I said, uh, Hey, we had this deal. If you want to call Bill, blah, 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 you know, explain the whole thing to him. He said, well, come, and, come in and see me Monday. We'll, we'll get this all taken care of. So I went in Monday. <laughs> Good old Ole. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking he's, we're, we're going to have this conversation of, oh, you've been getting screwed in your money that's bringing you up. Even if it was less than what those guys were making, but better than 300 a night. He said, well, I don't know what you're complaining about. He said, I, I reviewed what you're making, 300 bucks a night. He said, that's about what I was making when I was your age, so I don't know what you're bitching about. And I said, well, when you were my age, a hotel room was $15 a night, now it's $150 a night. A rental car was 10 bucks, now it's $65 a day plus miles. And it, what the hell does that have to do with the price of eggs in China? You know, what you were making 30 years ago, you were my age. And that wasn't with a corporate company. <laughs> right, right. And uh, so... At that point, it became clear uh, that, you know, it was just more push to pull there. And uh, I had gotten hurt in a match. Uh, my shoulder had gotten torn up in a match. And I had to go have my shoulder scoped. And it was going to be out for three weeks. At, at most three weeks, probably quicker. I was going to bounce back pretty quickly then. And uh, I went home and had the surgery. And I remember them calling, Dusty calling me and saying, "Can how quickly can you come back? We need you guys to drop the belt. Well, at that time, I couldn't even do this. And my arm was sort of like, you know, I was going to rehab. And I said, there's no way I can do it right now, uh, Dust. But, you know, as soon as I can get back, uh, 10 days, two weeks, you know, but, but as soon as I can get back. So uh, they start this dos hombres thing. 
with Ricky and and a, and a partner under masks saying it was Brian and uh, saying it was uh, me and him, me and Ricky. And in reality, it was Tom Zank on some tapes, and the others it was Brad Armstrong, which always was odd to me because not I had both of them had little tiny waistlines. I never had a tiny waistline, and they had no similar build. I had no similar build to them at all, you know. And uh, you know, you could look at it and clearly see it wasn't wasn't me. You could tell which one was Ricky, and. Uh, so I was at a gro at a uh, grocery store one night. I used to always go to the grocery store after midnight so I wouldn't get hassled. And I'm walking through, and each this guy and I keep passing each other in, in the aisle. Go to the next aisle, and he's going this way, and I'm going this way. The next aisle, this way, and then this way. And uh, he keeps looking. Every time we pass each other, he keeps looking at me like, I mean, I must be a wrestling fan, you know. And he's, he finally, after so many hours, he said, uh, Shane Douglas? I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, I'm buying groceries. What are you doing here? He said, uh, he said, I, I just saw you on TV tonight get, get, lose the belt. And I said, I don't think so because I've been, <laughs> I haven't been anywhere on the road for a while. He said, no, you and Ricky lost the belts tonight. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I called Ricky and he said, yeah, they had me and I think it was Armstrong that night. And uh, so I went back and looked at the tape and uh, of course the Shane Douglas Hombres, those hombres got beat. Uh, but Ricky Steamboat, you know, for anybody that's ever watched that segment, they probably have a take. The first thing Ricky does is the bell sounds, he jumps up and he pulls his mask off. And I've had a lot of people say to me, like, boy, he was really trying to bury you there. To the absolute contrary. You know, because the, 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 con the conventional wisdom being he pulled his mask off to show that it wasn't Steamboat that got beat. In reality, what he was doing, he pulled it off to show that's Ricky Steamboat because that can't be Shane Douglas, and so he would take his mask off too. And uh, I never, to this day, have understood why they couldn't have waited another two, two and a half weeks to get back to do it properly. I think it's a lot more impactful to have Shane Douglas get pinned than to have some guy you say is Shane Douglas under a mask get pinned. In an angle that doesn't make any sense at all. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> just, just to get into politics, and at that time, it's so, you know, I've been dabbling with this politics stuff and never liked any part of it. And, you know, when I went away and taught, uh, I didn't miss that part of it. And then I come back again, and here it is again, only worse. And uh, that's it. I'm done walking away, you know, with a degree, and I wanted to go back and get my uh, legitimate full master's, and then go on to get my PhD. Uh, I went back and got a teaching, had a teaching job lined up uh, in social studies, uh, my field, and. Uh, Late 92, early 93, give or I can't remember the exact time frame. In that time frame, Eddie Gilbert started calling and said that he was uh, going to work for this promoter in Philadelphia, uh, Eastern Championship Wrestling, and he wanted me to come in. And, and uh, just having come through this political bullshit with WCW again, I said, you know, Eddie, I, I'd love to work with you again. I said, but I'm. Um, done I'm getting out of the business I have no stomach left for it and a week would go by and he'd call me again and say well how about if we give you this much money instead of that much money and I said uh, thank you Eddie but it's not about the money and, and this went on for several weeks you know and him calling me once twice three times a week and keep sweeping the deal and you know this and that and you know it just, hey, thanks but no thanks I'm done I'm done I'm done but thank you for thinking of me but you know finally he said uh, what if we let you be the lead heel for the company and I remember thinking on the phone going like, like nobody's ever offered me that before, you know? And I thought, well, uh, I almost said no. And then I thought, well, it's for a little company in Philadelphia. I mean, how long is it gonna go, right? A week, month, two. And uh, so we agreed on a price and I said, I'll come out and do it, but if I see any signs of politics, any signs, I'm turning around and walking out the door. And he agreed to that. And I went to Philadelphia, and I remember the first day, uh, uh, we, Terry Funk and I had flown right around the same time. We were both picked up by the same car, and we were driving over to the hotel, and Terry always called me Shano. He said, well, he was sitting behind me, leaned up and tapped me on the street. He said, well, Shano, how long do you think we'll ride this train before it runs off the tracks? And we sort of joked and laughed about it and thought maybe two or three months, you know, before we'd be out of, out of business. 
neither of us, you know, I was still young and dumb to the business, but Terry, who was old and seasoned in the business, uh, he didn't see it going past that either. You know, uh, ECW really did the impossible. It became something, it was one of those things where all the, all the uh, parts of the machine were all lined up perfectly. The stars were all lined up perfectly. The, the major companies, WCW and WWF, had gone on cartoon land. Uh, the other smaller companies were falling away. Independents were doing okay business, but there was, there was a place for another company to provide a different product. And it was a very short span. Uh, one month, maybe two that I was here, uh, Eddie had originally called me the fabulous one. Shane Douglas like the fabulous Fargos. And, you know, Eddie was always kindling back to, Met to uh, Memphis. And uh, my ring music was Are You Gonna Go My Way by Lenny Kravitz. And, uh, you know, they, he, he gave me a decent little push, but it was, you know, just, just almost shameless as a baby face pretending to be a heel. Uh, it was sort of like wishy-washy, uh, no real direction. I mean, how do you know, what, what's a fabulous one? You know, it's 1950s that might have worked, not in the 90s. And uh, we went to a booking meeting one day and me, Doug Gilbert, Paul Heyman, Todd Gordon, Eddie Gilbert, uh, there were a few other people in there. And after a few minutes, Todd and Eddie got up and walked out of the room. And several minutes went by, maybe a half hour. Todd came back in and called Paul out of the room. And they left for a short while and came back. And Todd said, uh, with Doug Gilbert still sitting there, said, uh, Eddie Gilbert's quit and left the building. Uh, Paul Heyman is the new booker. It was that sudden. It was that quick. And it, we never got a full explanation as to why Doug, of course, jumped right up, took his stuff and left. And uh, Paul uh, did the tapings that night. I think that was the night that Paul had uh, introduced me in the ring uh, with Snuka and uh, Morocco and a bunch of other guys in the ring. And shortly after that at Valley Forge, we were doing a, a tournament, a title tournament to decide the ECW champion, my Eastern Championship Wrestling Champion. And it was a cage match for the title. And uh, that night in the dressing room, after that match, I'd won. And Paul came to the back and said, I have an idea for a gimmick for you. In 1993, the NFL had just started delineating one player per year as the franchise player. It was supposedly the most important player, the, the, the key player to each team. And uh, Paul said, I'm thinking about calling you the franchise. Well, at first it sounded odd because you know, we were just hearing this in the NFL and it seemed almost like we were following and copying. And uh, he said, I want you to be uh, that arrogant heel. He said, put it this way, you're the captain of the football team who steals everybody's girlfriend and fucks them. That was the only direction Paul ever gave me on the character. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I can play with that. Like, you know, the, to be that sort of dick in your face, you know, I'm better than you. And, uh, and then he had, uh, of course, Sherry Martell and Curtis uh, Hughes with me. And uh, that was where the franchise character came from. And the, the Perfect Strangers did not come till later. That originally was Chris Benoit's ring music. Then when we formed the original Triple Threat, me, Benoit, Malenko, it became the Triple Threat's music. They left shortly after to go to WCW, and just by proxy, it became my music. When I would go to the ring, the sound guy, not knowing any better, just kept playing Perfect Strangers. And I liked it a hell of a lot better than I like, oh, are you gonna go my way? So uh, that's where that came from. That's how it all started the franchise character. And what did you think about Sherry Martel being your manager? She's such a legend in the industry. And a well, WWE Hall of Famer, I guess now. Yes, I, I, I had known Sherry for years before that. Always loved Sherry, was always impressed by her work. Um, I was, I've been one of those guys that have never been, shouldn't say never, rarely impressed with women's wrestling. Uh, like when I would watch Moolah as a kid growing up, she looked like a woman pretending to do what guys do, to me, in, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Uh, Sherry was the first woman wrestler that I ever watched that I thought, damn, she's different. You know, she wrestled like a guy. 
And uh, but when you got to know her in the dressing room, she was such a sweetheart, such a loving person. You know, like your sister. You know, not anything like the characters she played on television. And I, hopefully, I think most people would say that about all of our characters. But Sherry really was dichotomous from from what she from the type of character that she played. Really cared about people. Was very humble, quiet. Uh, but also fun, you know, like she'd, she'd cut up and, you know, they're, they're just like the boys, she liked to have her fun. And uh, for me, I thought it was only a huge benefit to me because Sherry, you know, not that she would often do it. I think she always felt like it wasn't her place to. Uh, and I think part of the way the business was at that time, like a woman doesn't tell a man, like give her any pointers. And I said to her, if you have an idea, shoot it at me. If I ignore it, I ignore it. But if you got one, give it to me. And she would very very seldom but would you know Shane why not this or Shane you know she just give and she was the first one that hit me with the idea of when I was using a, a second like that a manager to have buzz phrases you know uh, uh, you know, to, to, to draw the ref or something to draw the attention or uh, take the camera off of me for a second. Uh, he, she was the one that gave that, that taught me that. And uh, I always loved working with Sherry. She, in fact, when she finally left to go to WCW, I, I couldn't fault her for doing it because, you know, they were obviously offering her a lot more money. But I have to admit, there was a part of me that was really sad to see her leave because she was just so great to be around and so fun and easy to work with with a ringside. You're mentioning all the names that were part of ECW at this point. Is it profitable at this point with no. all those big names now? No. The, uh, uh, you know, I think at that point they were still trying, Todd was still trying uh, with Eastern Championship Wrestling to use these stars of yesteryear to, to pull a crowd in. And there would be some semblance of the crowd that wanted to come see that. What was going to work was you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go if, if everybody is selling vanilla, you can't go and sell French vanilla and say you're different. It's still vanilla. And the business was all pretty similar flavors of, of vanilla, just using that flavor as an example. Suddenly ECW came out and was, you know, Rocky Road. You know, it was something completely different. Uh, I'm sure it turned a lot of fans off that were used to that traditional wrestling model. But there were also, I think, a lot of fans that had grown so tired of the, uh, you know, Dean Douglases and dead men coming back to life and evil hockey players with one blackened tooth and the evil plumber and just that stupid garbage crap uh, that suddenly here was a company that was talking to you in language that you use at home and on the street, uh, doing things that you'd always hoped for to see, uh, then it ramped up a violence that had not been seen in American wrestling before. Uh, we had heard about this, much like when I was a kid reading the magazines, we had heard about these ultra-violent matches in Japan, but again, you can only imagine, you weren't seeing them again with no live streaming, and suddenly here came ECW giving you something like that, and not just that, but here's Benoit who played Pegasus Kid in these matches, and here's Sabu who became a big name over there, names that we hadn't yet seen on the American scene because they hadn't been overexposed in the WWF and WCW and now they're here in ECW and oh yeah there's Shane Douglas used to be a world tag champion and there's Sherry Martell and there's and there's and there's there was enough there and each time that Paul would cut one like a Jimmy Snuka loose for instance nothing against Jimmy it was just a purely just looking at it from a business point of view uh, if we take Jimmy off and we free up some money to maybe bring in two or three other guys now you bring in a Dean Malenko and a Chris Benoit, or a Super Crazy and, and a Tajiri, or a Rey Mysterio, who, or an Iconium. You know, each time he would get rid of one of those larger names of yesteryear, he would bring in one of these new names that, that some segment of the audience was going, I mean, I would love to be able to see those guys. And here they were for the first time congregating together. In those early years, uh, Todd Gordon, I guess, was the backer. Where was his financial finances coming from? Todd's family uh, owned a, uh, a jewelry store, a well-known jewelry store downtown Philadelphia. Todd was individually wealthy, uh, but I would imagine much of that wealth was on paper. You know, it wasn't like he's got $10 million sitting in a bank vault somewhere. 
or some huge corporation that was willing to lend him you know whatever money he needed or the credit to get on a major network uh, so I've often in looking back wondered a how were they able to to do this because in the early days uh, first three to six months we'll say you know the ECW arena was not full the first couple uh, I think the first one or two shows had two or three rows of people uh, we were giving out free free uh, coupons for free beer and hot dogs uh, but once that caught it, it grew very quickly. It went from that two or three rows to 75% full, then jam-packed, then turn away crowds very quickly. But in Jim Thorpe, we were wrestling at the Flagstaff, there's 75 people in the building. Jammed. It wasn't like it was an empty building, but it was tiny, it was much, not much bigger than this room. And uh, those checks always cleared. You know, we'd wrestle in front of a couple hundred people over the weekend and my checks would clear, 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 clear. Uh, you know, and then <laughs> much later we'll get to it, I'm sure, you know, the Inverse Universe, suddenly we're wrestling in buildings in front of thousands of people, sellouts, and the checks are bouncing like rubber balls. Uh, but Todd's, uh, Todd's money came from, from, as far as I know, from the jewelry store, and I think there was a bit of family money behind it, uh, but it certainly wasn't wealthy to the point where he could have floated ECW through years and years of growth. Right. And a lot of people, uh, including me and a lot of wrestling experts, would say that ECW as Extreme Championship Wrestling really began when you threw the NWA title in the garbage. Mm -hmm. Could you just detail uh, who came up with that idea and what the whole fallout was from that? Yes, it, it was... Uh, I don't know if it was all Paul's idea or if it was Paul and Todd's idea. Uh, Paul called me a week or so before the tournament. We were still at that point, Eastern Championship Wrestling was still a, a, a member of the NWA. And at that time, we had started drawing those really strong houses, those sellout crowds, and I think we were the only NWA member to be doing that in the States. So <clears throat> they wanted to do the tournament in the ECW arena and uh, proffered the idea of having Shane Douglas, the, ch the ECW champion, become the NWA champion. And Paul called me and, and laid this idea out to me, which at the, when I, I remember vividly, I remember the first time that he told it to me, it sounded so, so uh, wrong, you know, like to, to, to do that, because it, it bled so much of the politics that I skewed in the business. And, uh, he, you know, but the one thing I'll say about Paul was he didn't call me and tell me I was doing it. Paul always gave me the option. You know, he would say, we can do this or we can do this. And he would tell you the good and bad of this, and he would tell you the good and bad of this. It wasn't like he'd say, we can do this, which is going to be really great, or we can do this, which is going to suck, but it'll be okay. He, he would give you all, all points of view on equal, equal footing. And, uh, through the course of the, the time, that week or two that it was leading up to the tournament, you can imagine in my head, uh, I'm wrestling with this because I you know, had grown up a fan of the NWA and had huge respect for most of those guys that carried, not all of them that carried that belt. And I would go through this, I'm gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I couldn't very well call my friends and say, hey, I, Paul's got this idea. You know, so I was sort of stuck with this, this on my own. And uh, Wednesday before the tournament, Mike Tenay had a radio show, nationally syndicated radio show uh, on, and he called me on Thursday and said, did you hear my show last night? I said, no, and he said, uh, I think you ought to go back and listen to the uh, archive I had uh, Dennis Corluzzo on. And he didn't talk very kindly about you. To my knowledge, I'd never met Dennis Corluzzo. I had known the name only because of the hotel where we're staying tonight. The first time I came into ECW, uh, Eddie Gilbert had to run over there to pick up the check from him. And we drove over with Eddie, sat in the car, he ran in and came out. I had never, I didn't know what Dennis Corliza looked like. I had never met him as far as I had remembered. And uh, so why would he, you know, if we're doing this this weekend, like, uh, it didn't make sense to me. So I went back and I listened and Dennis Corluzzo, remember at this time, we were still making about 75% of our money on independence, about a quarter of ECW. So I listened and he said on the, uh, in the interview, if anybody out there is thinking of, of hiring Shane Douglas, I wouldn't, because I can tell you on first-hand knowledge, Shane Douglas will take your, uh, 
take your deposit, not show up and he'll screw you out of the money. And I, I had never done that to anybody, never. And I thought, why the fuck would he say that? That's the dumbest thing in the world. And I, at the time, I, th I took it as an overt attempt to take food off my family's table. And, I, and it pissed me off. And I thought, so he's politicking on me now and I don't even know the guy? So that's what the industry is. I've learned the politics. I know how to do them. I'm playing with the best of them. I just choose not to. So I still, you know, of course, after listening to that, I, that pushed me towards, fuck it, I'm throwing the belt down. But then I, as I got closer to the day of doing it, I still had great reservations. I got to the ECW arena typically around 12, 30, 1 o'clock on a TV day. And I walked through the back door and this short, heavy set, sort of odd looking guy with a funny accent came walking up and shoves a contract with his. He was saying, sign this man, go sign this man. I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Dennis Cordoso, man, nice to meet you. And he's, you know, I'm thinking, like, what's, he, what's this guy doing in here, you know? And so I look at this thing, it's a legitimate contract. And he said, I got signed on the spot. And I said, at first of all, I don't sign, I wouldn't sign a contract from God until my attorney reads it, Dennis. So I'll take it on let my attorney read it. And he proceeded to follow me around the dressing room the entire night. At one point, I came out of a toilet stall, having taken a shit. And he was outside the toilet stall, and ready to open the door. He goes, here, saying, you sign this man? I was ready to knock him out. I was really getting pissed. I kept telling Paul, get him the fuck away from me, because if he keeps shoving that concert with us, I'm going to knock him out. And uh, so finally, Paul did his best to keep him away from me. And me. I went and dressed under the stairs with Taz and Perry and the guys in uh, I think Bam Bam and Chris, I don't think Bam Bam was there yet. Uh, and uh, now I've got three matches in the tournament to get through. Uh, first with uh, Taz, second with Milanko, and the third with uh, Too Cold. And the building was hotter than hell. Uh, extremely stifling hot, August night. And uh, so I had to get through these matches, and you know I still hadn't committed to doing it. In fact, when I'm in the match with Scorpio, I know I've got to ultimately make a decision pretty quickly here, and I start doing the promo. And you know I never pre-planned or, or wrote down any of my promos down. I just spoke off the, the mind. The whole time I was growing up with my dad, my dad was a like a legitimate superhero, you know, a World War II vet, you know, a decorated hero in the war, uh, you know, served under Patton's Third Army, uh, you know, 28 inch waist, 48 inch chest. I mean, I was built. Like, a picture of guy from World War II with a you know, holding an M60 machine gun and a carbine, and it just looks like like GI Joe, you know, <laughs> and watching, you know, he's like a legitimate superhero to me growing up and he said he used to tell me from the time I was a kid and I never knew what he meant he used to say son you can always remember you can walk with your feet on the ground like everybody else you can soar with the eagles and I go okay dad yeah that sounds good no idea what he meant by that and the moment in that promo where I stopped I said here we go dad my dad had just passed away uh, earlier like a few weeks before and uh, when I stung it, here we go, Dad, it was because I could feel my father's presence. And for the first time in my entire life, I realized what my dad was saying. You can go along and do what everybody else does and get what everybody else gets. Or you can take a chance to soar and, and perhaps do better. And uh, that's when I threw the belt out. As I'm cutting through the promo, the only part of the promo I, I was tr I tried to memorize, not memorize, but just, you know, I kept going over it in my head, was the long list of names of people that had carried that belt because I didn't want to miss anybody. And, you know, after these three matches, I'm blown up and it's hot and I'm trying to remember this promo and I'm going through it. And luckily the audience starts hitting out names. And Dory Funk, and Dory Funk, and Terry Funk, the man that'll never die, and and Dusty, and uh, Fat Man Dusty Rose, and I'm going through it. And it almost lent to the credibility of uh, of the reality of the promo because it was, you know, you could see it wasn't a scripted thing. Yeah. And uh, I hadn't yet made eye contact, and the reason I'm dragging this promo out is I'm still in my head going, "Do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it." My biggest hesitation to doing it had nothing to do with being nice or, or mean to Dennis Corluzzo. I didn't want any of those guys I had just mentioned to think that I was doing anything to shit on their legacy because it was anything but that. And that's why I said that for a company that died seven years ago, RIP. Um, uh, and that was the only hesitation I had. And as I'm doing that promo, if you watch close, you'll see my head turn to the left and they were, Todd was sitting with Corluzzo and Bob Ortiz, our ring announcer, uh, down at the front left corner of the ring. 
and I made eye contact with Corluzzo and all I could hear in my head was, he'll take your money and, and steal your money and fuck you. And that's when I said, and he can all kiss my ass and threw the belt right at him. Uh, thank God it worked. You know, there, there was no guarantee it would. There was every guarantee that, that more likely that the fans would go, fuck you, ECW and Shane Douglas. And luckily that more represented the the FTW attitude that Taz talked about later at ECW that, that really set us apart from everybody else. Uh, but it could have easily been the epitaph of my career. Thank God it wasn't. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that the NWA was dead seven years before that. Yeah. In my opinion, it's still dead, but some people are trying to uh, revive it now. Uh, what's your opinion of that? Uh, I, 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 to me, it's, it's like you can't relive ECW. You can't bring ECW. ECW has been gone now for, what, 18 years, 17 years, whatever it's been. Um, I don't think, like my kids grew up watching wrestling, they don't know what the NWA is. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of fans out there that still do, but all those fans that do remember it also know that it died a long time ago and that there's been multiple attempts at reviving it and none of them work. But with that said, uh, I think our business is in a very precarious place right now. I happened to be in it, thankfully, at a time when it went to levels that nobody could have ever seen coming. Uh, 48 to 50 million people per week watching wrestling and the television and you know, all the WrestleManias and all these huge pay-per-views and, and, and. It was just like a, like a nirvana that a guy like Bruno San Martino could never have imagined in 1969 or 1970. So to have seen and been in at that time and then now seen it reduced to two to three million fans per week for all intents and purposes. My my obvious question is, I know ratings are down everywhere, but are they down 96% everywhere? Like, is the NFL used to be drawing 150s in the ratings, now they're only drawing sevens and eights? I mean, because the, the wrestling industry is so totally down, and then you take in the fact that Two of those companies are no longer even around anymore. It's one company that should be drawing even better ratings than they were before. Um, and then when you understand the product that we do, uh, you can see clearly how far it's gotten away from wrestling and to what Vince would call sports entertainment. So with that said, I would hope that uh, uh, the latest attempt to revive the NWA would have, if not great success, some modicum of success. I hope TNA with their new backers, Canadian backers, would get hot. I hope the Ring of Honor would suddenly nail a rating. Uh, I'd hope five more companies would start up and get hot. I want to see the kids that are in the business today have the same opportunities that I had back then. If, uh, you know, at first with the, when I broke in with the territories, I could get told no 25 times, I still had a chance. Now you get one no and you're done unless you want to go you know dabble around in the business and how do you build a star dabbling around in the business uh so i want to see the business get back to it to where it's some semblance of that must see television you know it used to be on you know tuesday morning everybody at school was talking about hey did you see what, did you see what happened on raw last night did you see what happened on nitro last night and then you had the replays so i i, I would hope that they'd all get hot again the business it, it, as great as the places that we had seen it go I don't think anybody, Vince included, could imagine how much of that could be lost. So I, I agree. I think it's almost impossible to resurrect something. I, I don't know of any example where something in wrestling had been resurrected from that long ago. Um, and they can't erase the title holders that have held the NWA title. You were probably one of the last really credible ones. Yeah. I'm not sure the lineages uh, since then, but I have read some of the names and there's nothing on them even if you google the names so yeah it's you know it's been a shame that what what happened with it because he had so many i don't know each of the guys and i don't want to disparage any of them but it, there's been so many attempts and every couple years we hear somebody else is going to resurrect the nwa and the nwa has come back we all know the, the historic lineage of, of of the nwa and it will that will never be erased you know the, all those legendary names but to keep on saying Shane Douglas is going to buy it tomorrow, not Shane Douglas' is NW, and I'm going to rebuild it. And then after that, it's yours, and then after that, it's his, and after that, it's hers. At some point, you just have to say, let it go, and maybe try to build the next 
big thing. You know, when Eastern Championship Wrestling became Extreme Championship Wrestling, I'm sure there were a lot of wrestling pundits at that time saying, ECW, what the hell is that? Nobody's ever going to get behind that. You know, so there is something will become the next big thing. But I don't think it's going to be by resurrecting something from two plus decades ago. Right when you were really hot in ECW, to say the least, you were the franchise, both literally and figuratively, uh, you jumped to WWE. What was the process that led to you making that uh, jump? There was a long protracted uh, courting of me, Pat Patterson and Jim Ross calling me. And I was happy uh, in, in ECW. Uh, I wasn't happy teaching. Let me rephrase that. I love being in the classroom teaching the kids. I'm a, one of those dorks that just loves history and the Constitution and have spent my life learning it. And in a classroom teaching kids that want to learn, that's, that's almost as equal a high as being in front of 20,000 fans screaming. Um, it really is. I had one parent say to me uh, one time, her daughter, uh, she came to me at open house and she said, my daughter has always hated history class. She says, since she's had you, it's her favorite subject. You can't tell a teacher a better thing than that. And I used to get Christmas cards for about 20 years after that. I got Christmas cards from that girl every year. Um, so I, I do miss that. I don't miss dealing with idiot superintendents that are more worried about kids than some jerk-ass parent uh, their rear end as opposed to educating that child or those children. Uh, more afraid of lawsuits than, than educating. Uh, you, you can't, no success is ever built out of trying to just avoid something. Success is built out of forging forward and leading and I've, I saw very little of that in education. So I was as happy as I was in ECW, it still wasn't able to pay me the kind of money that at this time I'm really coming into my peak years in the business. And uh, I was making, a, between ECW and teaching, I was making good money, but I was killing myself to do it. Teaching five nights, five days a week, doing my lesson plans on Sunday, grading papers every free moment I had somewhere, uh, preparing my lesson plans, going to night school Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, going to the gym every day, sometimes twice a day, renovating a house. I was burning the candle on both ends in three places in the middle. So when... Jim Ross and Pat Patterson started courting me. You know, I'd had a successful run in ECW. I'd been the champion for some time and had had you know been involved in a lot of the major angles. Excuse me. And Jim Ross, there must have you know I, I didn't want to leave ECW, so I remember there was a lot of let me think about it, and I kept ending up with that and put it off for a while. And it, it bought me a week or two, and this went on for several months. Finally, uh, Jim Ross called me and said something that made me think. He said, you know, Shane, sometimes opportunity only knocks once. So I started thinking about it and I talked about it with my ex-wife and I thought, well, you know, let's, let's at least go hear out what he has to say. So he flew me up there five times before this. And on the sixth time, uh, on the fifth time that I was up there, uh, I said, uh, for some reason, I just couldn't bring myself to sign the papers. I kept saying, let me think about it and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And on the fifth time I said in the meeting in Vince's office, Pat Patterson was there and J.J. Dillon was there. He said, uh, uh, I said, you know, and it was bullshit. My ex-wife knew nothing about the business other than her husband was in it. I said, uh, you know, Carl and I share all of our decisions. And, you know all of the decisions we make in wrestling and you know almost like good cop bad cop so <clears throat> and I said that she just this conversation you know I said you know my wife really loves uh, Broadway plays so about a month month and a half later they uh, Vince calls and says that he wants me and Carter to fly up and so what the hell we'll go up in here hear what they you know finally get to the, the to the nitty-gritty of it they fly us up first class limousine picks us up at the airport drives us from LaGuardia to Stanford Connecticut to the Titan Towers we go in and I the whole way up my, my ex-wife was not very assertive um, she sort of like flowed to the back and allowed me to you know to, to, to do what had to be done and I told her on the way up I said he's gonna ask you 
And so if he does ask you, and he, I don't care if he asks you if you're comfortable, I want you to look him in the eye and I want you to tell him whatever is in your head. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't worry about mincing words. Don't try to avoid pissing him off. Say whatever pops into your head. And honest to God, in our entire relationship, the 18 years to get, we were together, I never saw her do it again. But at one point in the meeting, he said, Carla, Troy tells me that you guys share all decisions. Uh, I'm sure you must have some questions. Is there anything I can answer for you? And astoundingly, she looked him right in the eye and she said, my husband makes a significant income from ECW. He makes, between that and teaching, he makes a good six-figure income. He's at home, uh, he loves teaching, he loves ECW. ECW, he's worked for you before, he's worked for WCW twice before, he's worked for the NWA and UWF. Nobody's ever utilized his talents like ECW has. And on top of all that, he's in bed with me five nights a week. What could you possibly offer my husband to walk away from all that? Without missing a beat, her hands are like this on the, on the table. He leaned across and he patted her hand. He went, Carla, you have my word as a gentleman to make your husband a very wealthy man. And I jumped in on that. So I said, well, what are we talking about, Vince? Because I'm sure you and I have different definitions for the, for, for the word wealthy. He said, well, we don't guarantee contracts here in the World Wrestling Federation, but I assure you it's not uncommon for somebody in the position we're going to put you in to make a minimum of 300, 350 and 550000 a year base salary. So I said, okay. So we finished out the meeting, went back. They put us up in the Plaza Hotel and uh, right on... Uh, 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 what's the, the park in the Central Park, uh, New York, uh, in a suite, uh, $1,500 a night for the room. And they bought, we had tickets to the front row orchestra pit seats to, to see Miss Saigon that night. Really laid the red carpet out, a bottle of Cristal or Dom Perignon champagne in the room, a tray of uh, for exotic fruits dipped in chocolate and sprinkled with gold dust. It was really overdone, you know, and, and really meant, I guess, to, for me to drop my guard. So when I left, I still didn't sign. I said, there was just something in the back of my head that didn't feel right. So I left and I called Ricky Steamboat, uh, Sherry Martel, uh, Jake Roberts, Joe and Mike, the Road Warriors, uh, Rick Rude, Perfect, Big Boss Man, everybody that I had known and was close with it had, had made you know big money up there. And every single one of them told me the same thing. They said, that's what he told us and we got rich. So I dropped my guard, I was being paranoid, dropped my guard and signed. And it wasn't two weeks into my run that I thought I made a fucking mistake. What did I sign here for? Uh, it was just a really, really bizarre time. I first, I've often said, and I, and I stand behind it, the worst six months of my entire 38 years in the business. I wouldn't do it again and wouldn't advocate doing it again. It was a shits. When they were courting you, were they telling you about this Dean Douglas gimmick, or did they only bring this up after you were signed? No, they, uh, where the Dean Douglas gimmick came from was they, they took me into a boardroom with a bunch of writers sitting down at the other end of the, of the, of the table, the long table. They made me take my shirt off. Now, you know, all these women out there saying they were sexually harassed. Okay, I guess me too. Because they made me take my shirt off and I had to stand there and slowly turn in a circle and keep flexing for these guys as I turned in a circle. Very strange. And they're reading my resume. And of course, the thing that sticks out is I've been a teacher. You know, I've got masters, two master's equivalencies and was accepted to medical school. And so he's a pretty smart guy. So somebody said, well, let's make him the evil teacher. And they started kicking this idea around and then somebody said, no, 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 he, he's gotta be collegiate. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a professor. Uh, no, 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 he's a, he's a, and they kept ramping it up and then finally somebody said, he's a dean. And um, because of Shane Douglas, then somebody, the, 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 you can just see the brain work here. It's Dean, and another name with a D is Dean Douglas, and the world's smartest man. And then they kept going like, like so far past the point. He's got, a PhD, no, 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 he's got seven PhDs. He's the world's smartest man. It was just like watching like an evil scientist at work, like let's see how crazy we can make this, you know? It was just overkill. And the franchise character to me, that what made it work was that there was a connection between the things that Shane Douglas, the franchise, was saying, looking into that camera lens or that camera lens and, and talking to somebody at home 
and making a point shooting on Ric Flair, shooting on the WWF, shooting on Hulk Hogan, uh, things that every fan was thinking that nobody had ever said was always taboo. So the franchise was really the first real shoot character on when after wrestling had gotten huge and realism and suddenly here here is this cartoon character in powder puff baby blue and you know not allowed to use voice inflection even though his promos were renowned for heat uh the world's smartest man seven phds he's smarter than everybody on the planet nobody yeah, tried that with lenny poffo <laughs> right right and and then that that i don't know if, they, if, if maybe they got had a run they like vince bought a great big truck full of baby blue out material or something but remember you had uh 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 louis piccoli was in powder puff baby blue then the body donnas were in powder puff baby blue then they put me in powder puff baby. i don't know if vince thinks that powder puff baby blue strikes fear in the hearts of men or something but it's it's sort of lacking something and uh the, the almost the biggest mistake i sort of throw this in there for, for clarity on everything that i made in that whole deal was i could not imagine anybody seeing Shane Douglas as anything other than the franchise by that point. You know, in 96, I was really one of the hottest heels in the, in the industry. And I went to Vince and I had trademarked and copyrighted the franchise Shane Douglas, the franchise Shane Douglas, the triple threat. And I said to him, uh, why not just let me be the franchise? That's what everybody knows and expects of me. Uh, that's what's comfortable for me. We can put a bunch of new you know, of parameters to the character and add to it, but build on that base. And in lieu of that, I'll sign, because I knew that everybody said that if he didn't create it, and I said, in lieu of that, I will sign the copyrights over to you for the length of the contract. Thank God he said no, because had he not, when I left, I'd had to go back and been Joe Blow the, the plumber. You know, it's, uh, and, you know, it was thank God that Vince's narcissism led him to screw himself and, and keep me from screwing myself. Now, uh, you ran into some issues with the click. Yeah. You wanted to, we use Quebec or Pierre on our events in uh, Canada where we run. He's our champion. Now, yeah, but, uh, great guy. I've heard you tell the story about him. Yeah, um, true story. You want to just tell, talk about the difficulty that the click was to deal with at that time? Well, understand that, you know, two of the members of the clique uh, I had had long relationships with. Scott Hall and Shawn Michaels were uh, in, uh, in WWF in 1990. Me, Shawn, Marty, and uh, Dustin. We, everybody calls us the Four Amigos. Where you saw one of us, you saw four of us. And we were inseparable. When, when they came to Pittsburgh, I would give them the key to my brother's house. My brother was a set designer in Hollywood. He had this big house up on the hill, and the fridge was always stocked, and you know, several rooms. And I'd give them the key, and I'd go to my apart, little apartment. I'd say, "Go, Hank, it's your home. Make yourself at home." And you know, you do that for me. Five years from now, ten years from now, things turn around and I'm in a position you're, and you're coming in. You don't have to ask her. It's done if you take care of me. That's just the way I, I am. So I didn't expect Sean to become the shithead that he did. And the same thing with uh, Scott was that when uh, 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 Johnny and I were together as the dudes, uh, he always had money for pot. He always had money for pills, but he never, rarely, I shouldn't say never, but he rarely had money for gas or rental car or hotel room. And Johnny would always, always say, I oh, just jump in with us, you know. Same thing about with Sean. You know, you do that for me, allow me to buy my, my pot and my pills and don't expect me to pay for the room and, and, and whatever else. You know, I'm going to take care of you down the road. So I dropped my guard with both of those guys because I didn't expect there to be any issues. I just I just counted them as friends. Uh, Kevin and I, Nash, had known each other in 93 in WCW. I always got along fine with Kevin. Same thing with Hunter. Never had any issues with Hunter. And I didn't really know uh, Sean Waltman. I, I mean, I, you know, I'd seen him here and there and never had any real issues with him. And uh, I remember... The one of the first, cause remember there was like a month, month and a half period where the Dean character was doing just vignettes from the uh, studio. And uh, one of the first shows that I did on the road was in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, they Bill Watts was in booking at that time. And they called me and uh, Scott Hall 
Sean Waltman, Bob Backlund. They called us all to the first aid room in the arena, in the Lansing Arena. And it was a long, thin room. The gurney was turned sideways at the end, and then, you know, a couple cabinets and stuff. Like a first aid station. And Scott was sitting on the gurney, and he was sort of playing drums. And he had a good old time. He had a big smile on his face. Uh, the rest of us come walking in, and Bill's standing there, and he's got a clipboard. And he goes, okay, guys, in the segment, whatever, tonight, uh, uh, Shane, it's going to be you versus Scott. And... Uh, He's you know talking the whole time. Scott's doing this stuff, and Bill stops about halfway through and he goes, uh, "Shane, what do you use for a finish?" As soon as he said that, Scott went, mm, "Stop beating the drums or anything like whoa." And I remember vividly seeing that and thinking, "Well, you know, I just had to go out and bump my ass off for him, and you know, we'll figure something out that makes sense." And you know, I had been around the business long enough to know, and trained by the right people that. If you start stuttering step, stepping me, or lead assing me, going up for a slam or whatever, you don't need to do it twice. I know as soon as you start doing it, what you're doing, and I'll just try to overcompensate. But in the long, long run of it, it's going to make the mask look like shit. And you know, I would think that anybody like Vince or anybody that's been around the business for any length of time would be able to clearly watch a video. I could watch any video and go, this one or that one is is causing it. You know, you can clearly see it. And uh, it was pulling teeth that night with Scott. And uh, there was a lot of that up there. A lot of this, like this boo-boo face that like somebody had to do a job or whatever. And uh, then there were like little comments. I remember one night Scott, you know, I was being very careful with my punches and stuff. I didn't, you know, in ECW we laid stuff in pretty solid. And I didn't want to get a reputation up there and, you know, bust somebody hard by somebody or whatever. And all of a sudden, oh, he's the dangerous guy to work with. So one night, Scott came back in front of the dressing room. He said, uh, he said it loud enough for everybody to hear. Like, like and I guess in order to try to embarrass me, he thought. He said, uh, Dean, uh, as WWF guys, we're every bit as tough as you ECW guys. You don't have to worry about pulling your shit, brother, with, with me. Lay it in. Okay, got it. The next night, I went out and did exactly what we would do in ECW. I didn't stiff him. I didn't potato him. I snugged it like we would in ECW. Never once in ECW, whether it was... Taz, Bam Bam Bigelow, or Francine, or Bill McGillicuddy. Not one time did I ever have anybody complain in ECW. And the very next night, Scott Hall comes back into the dressing room and goes, Dean, I know what I said last night, but God damn, you didn't have to kill me out there. You know, I was like, well, which is it? You know, are you guys as tough as the ECW guys? Because that's how we did it in ECW. Or do you want me to just pull my shit and take it real? I can be, I can do any, either way. Uh, you know, and, and I just remember thinking to myself how embarrassed I was for him that he would do that. Like, yeah, you're, you think you're trying to make fun of me in the dressing room, but you just made yourself look like a pussy. And, uh... And it was clear from then that there was there was a lot of tension, and it was building. Then we they uh, had a segment where Vince had already told me and Sean he said told us together what the angle was going to be. He wanted to be a repeat of the uh, Rick Rude Ultimate Warrior match, where Rude beat him, or I would beat Sean for the Intercontinental Belt, and then at WrestleMania it would be Tim Music for the World Title. And I was fine with that. It's a great build-up, and you know, Sean's an incredible worker. Why can't we make this work? So we were in Valparaiso, Indiana, and they put me and Sean in a dark match at the very outset of the show. Bill was right back at the gorilla position. And uh, 17,000 people, I remember the place was sold out. And we circle around each other, we go to lock up, and right as we go to lock up, Sean takes a flat back bump, and he's laying in the middle of the ring laughing. And I knew right now Bill Watts is having a stroke in the back. So I looked at him and I said, unless you want to get your ass stretched, you just get back to your feet to fucking wrestle. And he jumped up and he kept going, take it easy, Dean, take it easy. He's just ribbing you, he's just ribbing you. Well, I don't take that as a rib. You know, if you're out in front of, if you want a rib, let's rib me in the dressing room. Rib me at the hotel. You know, don't come out here in front of 17,000 people and expose the goddamn business and say it's a fucking rib. If you want to do it in your match, you're fine, but don't do it in mine. And uh, so I came back to the dressing room first. I was pissed because every time I'd call something, you know, I'd say like clothesline, you the backdrop. And I go, clothesline, God damn it. And the whole match was like that, very choppy. We, I come to the dressing room first and I was pissed. And Bill Watts, I turn the corner and Bill goes, I want to hear a fight. It was the only time I ever talked back to Bill. I want to hear a fucking word. I said, talk to your golden boy. And uh, walked right past him. At the In Your House in Regina, is when we were supposed to do this. Uh, Winnipeg, you mean? 
No, it was Regina. Okay. It was Regina. It was in your house. Oh, okay. Um, uh, it's Manitoba, isn't it? Regina, Manitoba. Oh no, I think you went to Regina the next night that tour because I think Manitoba is Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatchewan. They did like okay. Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, Saskatoon after. I think. Okay, whichever one it was, it was man. It was the in your house show yeah. when he was supposed to drop the belt. Yeah, I was in Germany on that loop for three and a half weeks before that, and while we were in Germany, we got this story that Sean had been attacked by like. 15 or 18 or 20 p some like crazy number well anybody that knows sean knows he's not a fighter you know so yeah you know, you know who, who like you know rick rude's a tough guy you knew mike hanks was a tough guy you know sean's not a fighter yeah. and uh, so to hear this one like some not adding up you know they, they took that many people to beat sean michaels up and we got back and uh now remember we had told both of us we were we, i already had the plane ticket to fly in on tuesday to there and because Vince me and Sean were supposed to be in to go to work this week on the finish for that match for him dropping the belt to me and uh, I get a phone call the day after I got back from Germany from Davy boy and Davy boy uh, they said you hear about Sean I said yeah and I said what the hell's going on? He said well, what you heard is bullshit he said uh, and he told me the whole story Sean was drunk and was getting a little bit forward with a girl that was dating a marine or married to a marine the marine was there with some buddies and sean got a little bit lippy and mouthy so davy boy and uh x-pac decided to get him out of there as they're driving out in the parking lot as luck would have it the marine and this girl are standing there on the corner in the front of the bar sean rolls his window down and starts from his mouth the marine grabbed him pulled him through the window beat the shit out of him davy boy jumped out of the car put the car in park jumped around with the car and came around the car and all the guy's friends jumped on him. Davey sort of black eye and bruises and scratches. I get a phone call from, and well, Davey boy said to me, uh, you know, Sean's been running his mouth about you the whole time you've been in Germany. I said, what's he been saying? He said, he's been telling everybody he's gonna embarrass you on, on the uh, pay-per-view. I said, well, if he tries, I'll stretch his ass. That was all was said. And I knew Davey boy was stirring the shit because I knew Davey would love to rip. So I get a phone call the next day or the day after that, like a day or two later from J.J. Dillon saying, uh, yeah, you don't need to fly in to Regina early or not, early now, you can just, you know, come in on Saturday. Uh, I said, why is that? And he said, well, the, the, uh, there's not gonna be a match. Sean's had a relapse of his concussion. Now remember, I was accepted to medical school, so I know you don't relapse concussion unless you get hit in the head again. And I said, well, how did he get hit in the head again? He said, oh, he didn't get hit again, he just had a relapse. I went, okay, <laughs> ding, the light bulb went on. I got, now I got the full picture here. So I fly in, last flight, me and Jim Cornette were on the last flight in. I get to the hotel, I was room with Dustin Rhodes, and uh, I went up to the room, and Dustin had a note on the bed or the counter saying, uh, everybody's down in the bar waiting for it, you know, for everybody. So I got my stuff put away, and I went down to the bar, and I, the bar was packed, wall-to-wall -wall people, fans and boys. And as I walked in, I saw this. So I started looking and it's uh, Scott Hall waving me over. And that's strange because you know, Scott and I weren't exactly buddies at that time. So he tell me he's got a seat for me, so I'm walking over and if you knew anything about, about Scott was when he's drinking, you know, he, he, he couldn't keep this, this secret to save his life. So I walked over and sat down next to him and he said, uh, I just want to tell you congratulations. I said, for what? He said, well, you didn't hear it from me, but you're getting the belt tomorrow. Now, where I come from in the business, if you and I have an angle, and the only other person that should know should be Vince. Nobody else besides me, you and Vince should know what's going on in that. And uh, I said, well, I heard Sean's not working. He went, he wouldn't say anything more. He's gonna like, give me that, that, that routine. And uh, so I get to the building the next day. I have no idea what's waiting for me there, but I get to the building next day, and right as I pull in, Sean pulls in next to me. Now remember, we've heard this story, he's been beaten up by 325 people. You know, I'm expecting to see him, like David Boy, bruised up and black eye and that kind of, he's out of the car, he looks fresh as a daisy. Okay, that was strange. So we get out and we walk in, and as I even said something to him like, uh, hey, here I had a tough time in Rochester, and he's, yeah, ha, ha. We walk in, I go left into the dressing room, he goes into the makeup room. About a half hour later, I go out to go to the catering. He comes out of the makeup room and he's got the contact lens in them. And I made a comment on what well, makeup girls must be tough on. He goes, yeah, ha, 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 and chewing his gum. Goes on about his business. Like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? So I go down to catering. I still have no idea what the match is gonna be. You know, Sean's not wrestling. How am I getting the belt? And 
they send for me to, get, to go to meet with Vince. So I go into Vince's room. Vince always had, like in that case, whatever the local hockey team was, that was Vince's office. Only Vince could dress in the, the local K hockey team's dressing room. But when I walked in, there were no other lights except the one security light in the, in the locker room. So it's pitch black except for this one light over this, de this table that Vince is sitting at. So I go walking in and Vince starts laying out the, the bullshit. You know, I, you know, I'm, you know, you've been a fantastic employee and appreciate everything you've done here. You're so great at getting heat. He's going through the whole thing and he starts telling me about how, unfortunately, uh, you know, well, before we even got to talking about the match, he said to me, uh, you know, we believe that the fans should always go home happy. And I said, well, that's why I would disagree with you. I said, I, you know, I, I've seen firsthand in my career that a heel <laughs> going over sometime with some heat draw, forces those fans back next time. And he stuck to his guns and said, well, we understand that, but that's how things run here. Like it's an alternate universe, like physics fall up there. And uh, so he starts to tell me what he has in mind. And he said, uh, you know, I'm sure you heard of Sh about Sean and he's not going to be wrestling today, but uh, so I want you to get out of the ring and, you know, you cut one of those promos you do to get that heat that you're so well, at, you know, so great at getting and uh, he said, then Sean's going to come down in his street clothes, he said, and, uh, and forfeit the belt to you. I went, oh, please don't do that, Vince. So why not? I said, my entire career since I've been old enough to understand what I've been watching, I've heard fan, heard champions say, you'd have to pry this belt from my cold, dead hands. I'll spill blood, sweat, and tears, but, or it's like a little bump on that, then I'll stand it over to you. I said, if you want, have him come out and chin music me. He can pin me in the middle of the ring. That's fine. But don't do that. You know, that's what we have to do. And now we've been sitting here talking for 45 minutes at this point, back and forth, back and forth. He and I sitting from here to the cameras away. Then he goes. Uh, then at that point, he goes. You know, you take that that belt from Sean. And then at that point, he was like, so I'm staring at him for him. Like, what's he fucking doing with his hand? So I follow his hand down, and I keep going. And sitting over here in one, of the, in one of the lockers, in the shadows, is Scott Hall, who's been listening to this conversation the entire time. And I went back at Vince and I thought, what kind of fucking game are you playing here, dude? Like, what's the big secret of hiding Scott? Like, do you expect me to say something bad about Scott? And if I did that, I wouldn't back it up anywhere or, or try to say I didn't say it? It was just, just very strange to me. And, uh... He then said to me, you know, you, you, whatever finish you want to do. So there's only one that makes any sense. You know, the, you know, you draw the belt. Otherwise, the fans are going to clearly see you were just taking it from baby face to baby face, which does Scott no good. It does Sean no good. It sort of does me no good. And uh, so I suggested the finish where he pins me. I slide my leg under the bottom rope. And which should have broken the count. It gives me something as a heel to fire back on heat from. Here's my point, legitimate point. And, and he said, great, we'll do that. But if you go back and watch the commentary, nobody ever comments on that. The camera never cues in on it. It's just typical political bullshit from WWF. Uh, the, the, the click thing, and you, you, like the story you said about, uh, you know, about... Uh, uh, Quebec or Pierre. Yeah, Pierre. Jean-Pierre. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jean-Pierre, yeah. You know, is that, that story is 100% true. Uh, everything I said, and I've said that, told the story for years. I <laughs> argue with anybody to say I, they've heard version A, version B, version C. Uh, I remember it as vividly as if it was yesterday. His career never recovered from that, actually. Exactly. And he had done the right thing. He had brought the house up, and had they done a hot finish there with Kevin with that title, it would have probably doubled the house the next time. Instead, the click wanted it to get their way and got it and screwed him, screwed his family, and did nothing for Montreal. So, Vince, who did you really help? So you left WWE shortly after that. You went back to uh, ECW, and there ended up being numerous pay issues as time went on in ECW. Not, not immediately. Uh, when I first went back, Paul, it was almost like Paul was like giving me a receipt. You know, like, okay, you left, now we're gonna make you earn your spot back. And I was fine with that. I didn't want to, nor should I have been able to walk right back into a top spot. But, and it also was less pressure for me. You know, it was, didn't have to worry about worrying that the house was packed. That's Ravens or somebody else's concern now. Uh, but Paul, for a long time, wouldn't even talk to me. You know, like, give me like the cold shoulder, <laughs> like middle school. And, uh, 
I had a lot of fun when I first went back. I was thrilled to be back home, first of all. And coming back in as a heel, it allowed me to play up off the heat for leaving to go to WWF. So it was easy. The first thing that I did when I got back, though, was I was at the uh, uh, Lost Battalion Hall in Queens. They had a, the show, and I wasn't on it. I just was there, like, watching. And afterwards, we're doing uh, uh, promos. And uh, Francine and the Pitbulls got up, and Franny was wearing the, you know, the leather bondage like, outfits, and she was so her, she looked so uncomfortable on camera. Her voice was wavering, and she's shaking. And so I pulled her aside. And I, I'd never met Franny. It was the first time I met Francine. She wasn't there when I left. And I took her and walked her over to the corner, and I said, "You know, why are you so nervous?" And she said, "You know, just I'm, I'm giving her pointers." And I said, "Look into the cameras." Feel it on. She's talking. You're talking to friends. Are you like everybody? Is anybody in the room here makes you uncomfortable? No. So well, you're talking to us. Just talk to me. You know. And and I gave her pointers, and Paul saw that. Paul saw me giving her those pointers, and instantly came up with this idea of putting the two of us together. And uh, that's where the Francine came thing. The Francine Shane Douglas connection came from when I came back, and it was so perfect because it validated. The, the, the thing that, shut, that Vince or, or uh, Paul had originally told me, that, you know, the captain of the quarterback, the quarterback of the team, the captain of the football team that steals everybody's girlfriend. Uh, and Franny, who was really pretty new to the business, really took to like a fish to water. She really did pick up, pick it up quickly. But yeah, remember though, she was stepping in at a point with, with somebody that uh, had really been around the business, had been taught from some of the best, Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Eddie Gilbert, uh, Paul Heyman, uh, Dominic DiNucci, Bruno San Martino. And suddenly she's here and, and on a night to night basis getting hours of talks about why you do it this, don't do that, turn this way, not that way. And explaining the psychology to her. So Franny really picked it up quickly and then did great with it uh, if you look at that very first time when she turns and you know she takes the thing off she still looks uncomfortable like not quite in her element but then you go back and see her doing things later like when like she dropped walked across the ring and dropped down and slinked across the ring and slid up my leg to kiss the belt perfect Francine I mean you couldn't have scripted it better than that I didn't tell her to do that that was her and it was so perfect for that and uh, what no, what we couldn't do is Paul didn't want us to let anybody know that it was work uh, I was married uh, Franny and I were always just professionals you know I, there was never anything other than a professional relationship there but she had, uh, I'd made her stay in the room with me because if she stayed with Buell, then everybody would know why, and she was shame. Uh, and it worked to the point where Taz later, like after about a year, year and a half, Taz and Perry and a couple of the guys pulled me aside and, you know, said, you know, you're a fucking hypocrite. I said, well, okay, well, I'll bite. What makes me a hypocrite? Did you always talk about how much you love your wife and every weekend you come out and you're, you know, you and Francine. And I, yeah, you're right. You caught me right handed again. Because Paul didn't want to take the sheets. He didn't want Meller or Kelser to get it and Keller or Meltzer to get it and, you know, stooge it out to everybody that it was just a gimmick, which I think would have taken a lot of the glare off of that. You know, we do the hold the ropes and the chest beat and her take the clock walk. Uh, things like sliding up my leg to kiss the belt. Uh, all those vignettes that we did, uh, you know, that, that when you, if you watch those vignettes back and, and tell yourself, this was all just a gimmick, and then you watch it, something just, some of the magic just falls away. But you look at it and say, Shane Douglas, you think was fucking around on his wife, and watch those and go, takes on a whole life of its own, which is the way an angle should be done. And you're very remembered for that time for your promos on Ric Flair. <laughs> um, Dick Flair. Yeah, how much of that was shoot? And when you went back to WCW uh, in your last run there, uh, did you ever have a yes. confrontation with him? Yeah, not a confrontation, a, a meeting. Um, what I said about Rick, I stand down. I've seen that Rick, and I'll clarify in a second, he's gone out and said that I went up to him and said that it was all a work. No. What I told you, Rick, was that it became a work after about two, the second year. I kept going to Paul and saying, please give me something else to talk about. The reason I started shooting on Rick in the first place, and it backfired, was that outside of Charlotte, his home, and Chicago, Philadelphia was probably his third most over town. They loved and adored Rick Flair in, in Philadelphia. Well, we were getting a mixture of responses, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, Franny was getting a yeah, pretty looking girl. Uh, Bam Bam was getting that sort of applause. Candida was getting that sort of golf applause in between. And we couldn't get that real solid fuck you guys that we were looking for. And so I thought, well, if I go out in Philadelphia where they love and adore Ric Flair and start shitting on Ric Flair, it'll put heat on me. That didn't work that way. When I come back and all of a sudden people were holding up signs, Flair is dead and, you know, long live the, the, the new nature boy franchise. It was not what I was going for. But everything that I said was said because of things that happened with Rick. Uh, the politicking and the, 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 the continual, like when he was head of the, the booking committee. Okay, nothing I can do about the name, uh, Shane. It's completely out of my hands. Because I'm sure Rick or uh, Jim Herb would have never listened to anything Rick Flair had to say. Uh, and I watched him systematically when he did the angle with, with Brian Pillman, when Pillman first came in. You go back and look at that closely. He wasn't doing anything to get Brian over. He was going to get a great match for himself because at the end he was going over. And there's a difference. There's a stark difference. Our business is predicated off when it's when you've had your run and it's that time. You graciously pass that torch to the next and explain, teach that guy how to draw so that you can collect money off of him drawing now or her drawing. I never saw that from Rick. And so I, I fired on him and said things that I fervently believe and I stand behind to this day. Uh, after a year and a half or two years, whatever it was, period, where it was obvious to the ECW fans that Rick was not coming, uh, couldn't come. Although there was a point when he almost did. Um, I couldn't keep it, it almost looked uh, disingenuous of me to keep calling out a guy that I knew wasn't coming. So I went to Paul and said, please give me something else to talk about. I've got to have something else. And he said, no, keep firing on Rick, keep firing on Rick, keep firing on Rick. And I didn't want to, not out of any love or care for Rick. I just, I needed something more to talk about, something new. And uh, so it was what Rick has said that I, you know, went to him and said it was all a work. No, it was not all a work. Uh, it became a work at a point uh, after it had run its course and it was time for me to say something else. Um, but what the fans don't know, and I've talked about this before, was that right around the time that Arn Anderson came in, there were discussions uh, for there to be a match between Rick and I in ECW. It was around the time that he was having his, his trouble with Bischoff and his contract. And uh, Arn asked Paul, told Paul that Rick said he'll come in, you know, one time put Shane over, but he, he needs like, it was like $150,000, I think, or a hundred, some six figure number, which was like a hundred million dollars to us. We couldn't afford that. And I knew that uh, Arn kept asking questions of like, what what guarantees does Rick have that Shane won't, you know, shoot on him or whatever. And I said, look, come on. I mean, if I'm gonna, you know, if I'm gonna fight, I'll fight him in the back. Um, so I suggested to Paul and Arn, to offer him a three match deal where I would lose to him first in Charlotte, pretty gracious for the, the young franchise to go in his backyard and get pinned. He comes to Pittsburgh, loses to me. Now we come to Philadelphia and do a pay-per-view. And you know, so I'm, I'm as much as I can giving it up first. You know, and uh, if that, you know, someone like Rick would clearly understand what that meant. And it would have been a lot more money than 100000 too, because it was going to be something like 10% of the, of the pay-per-view and, and, the, and the live gate. Which I think, had we done that, we could have sold out the spectrum. Uh, right after that, I forget how long it was, but there was a, still a point where they were having trouble with this contract. And it was going to happen, it was going to happen. And all of a sudden, he re-signed and stayed, and that killed the idea forever. But... Uh, when I went back to WCW, uh, Bischoff was very gracious. I've been pretty outspoken against both WWF and WCW. And Bischoff, he could have called me and said, like Vince did, Vince offered me $115,000. So I told Vince. And uh, Bischoff called, uh, well actually Dusty Rhodes called me and said, uh, back to Tanae, before Dusty. Tanae called me and said, did you hear my show last night? Uh, Dusty was on and he, he really put you over on the show. Now Dusty and I had, had some heat. So I went back and listened and, and he said, uh, Shane Douglas is the Ric Flair of his generation. 
So I called Dusty to thank him. And I said, you know, I know there's been some heat between us, Dust, and I'd said some things. I said, but what you said last night, I really appreciate that. You know, thank you. And he said, uh, have you signed with Vince yet? I said, not yet. Why? And he said, do you mind if I bring your name up at a booking meeting? I said, no, knock yourself out. Within a matter of 72 hours, I had talked to Bischoff. He brought my name up. Bischoff inquired, called me, and I had a three-year, seven-figure income. Consider that I was $144,000 in the hole from ECW, and a lot of that money I'd spent out of my pocket for ECW. Uh, that saved my financial life. And I was thankful to Bischoff and WCW for it. And Bischoff knew that there was draw between me and Ric Flair. Every wrestling fan knew there was legitimate heat. So I signed and went, and the first, uh, I took my wife, because I know I was going to be busy for three years, I took her on a, like a two week cruise. We came back into Florida, and instead of flying home, I put us up in the, uh, we just jumped around Florida for a couple days. They were going to be in Jacksonville that Monday. So we ended up in Jacksonville. I left Carl at the hotel because I figured I had some politics to take care of and I had to talk to Rick. So I walk into the building. If you've ever been to the Jacksonville uh, arena, there's, you know, they've got the big regular garage door and then there's a door about this wide and hallway about this wide where you have to walk past like a, almost like a bank teller, you know, to get through this hallway and you can just, you can sort of turn sideways and squeeze through. Well, I get in, you know, and everybody's walking around the backstage area and, you know, Sandman was there at the time, Peaches was there, Mikey Whipwreck was there, and plus, you know, a lot of guys I'd known like Hugh Morris and Sting and Steiner and Rude. And so all these guys are coming by and I'm saying hello to everybody. I, nobody, nobody said anything. I felt Ric Flair walk in behind me. And before I even turned, I went, Rick, how are you? And, I, and sure enough, he's standing right there behind me. And he goes, how are you, sir? And he puts his hand out and I shook his hand. And he went to walk away and I didn't let go of his hand. I pulled him back. I said, I really think you and I should talk to you, Rick. And I wanted to say that in front of everybody to put him on the spot. Otherwise, he'd just say, nah, fuck you. And uh, he looked around and he said, yeah, yeah, give me like 15, 20 minutes to settle in. So I went down to catering intentionally took like 45 minutes because so I wanted to give him time to think about it. So I went back up and I knocked on the door. He said, come on in. I opened the door and he was sitting there in his under tights and he had one boot on and laced and the other one he was lacing. And he jumped up holding the laces and he came over. He said, I just want to start by saying I'm sorry. Because, you know, we had both said some pretty, <laughs> pretty stiff things about each other. And I said, I'm not going to accept that, Rick. I said, because I know it's not genuine. I said, but I'm not going to apologize to you because you would know it's not genuine. Uh, I said, but that's exactly why I think this can work. And I said, so I'm looking in the eye and I'm going to ask you as a man and as a professional, are you going to do everything you can to uphold this angle? Because I really believe it could help turn WCW back in number one. And he agreed and he said, yes, sir. Yes, I do. That was exactly what he said to me. I said, I'm going to hold you to that. And afterwards, I found out from people in the office that almost from that day forward he went to work politicking and so when the ultimate match finally came up after i did all these things them jumping him and doing all these screws and really making him a baby face uh I, the reason if you look back at the match david flair was involved uh vince russo was involved there was all this people the dog and pony shit show running in and was vince russo booking at that time was yeah it? him and bischoff they were doing the co-booking thing Okay, so ultimately it was a disappointment for you from as good of it. it wasn't in Philadelphia either, was it? No, it was in Kansas City uh, a few months after Owen Hart had fallen to his death. So just to quickly sum up your time in WCW, uh, I guess it was a financial benefit, yep. but it's not really the most satisfying professional. No, I, I, the, the, the stuff, again, back to the politics, that how many times we've heard that in this interview. Um, you know, I remember watching they'd have the board set up in the back with two or three hours worth of tapings, and Kevin Nash would walk in and he'd walk over and look at it and he'd erase this match and this match and this match and he'd write whatever matches he wanted in and then Scott Hall would walk in and he'd erase this match and this match and this match and he'd write in whatever he wanted and then somebody else would erase whatever. You know, if I'm booking a show, if you're booking a show, if, if God is booking a show and writes out a card and he comes in and erases what matches he doesn't like and then he does and you do and she does and I do, all of a sudden, that that those cards no longer have, carry what we all, whoever booked it, intended. And uh, I remember just watching that and thinking, like, why doesn't somebody tell them, sit the fuck down, <laughs> right, put it back the way it was? And uh, there was none of that. 
and then you know the stuff that happened when they started the uh, millionaires versus the the uh, the new blood that was the angle that i thought really had the the ability to, to turn things back in WCW's favor. Because keep in mind, they had you know some really incredible people, Benoit, Malenko, Conan, uh, Raven, uh, 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 Vampiro, uh, uh, Rey Mysterio, me, uh, 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 <laughs> so bad with names anymore. Um, You know, enough people there, you know, enough talent on that new blood that had the Millionaires Club done what they should have done and passed those. Through. It doesn't mean getting beaten every match. It doesn't mean, every, okay, Shane, you go out and beat Ric Flair, and then you go out and you beat Hogan, and you go out and you beat him, and you go out and beat him. No, you build those angles and, and do them properly. That that really could have turned the, the, the course back to, to WCW, I believe. And yet instead, we saw all those same politics like when Hogan refused a job for, for, for Jared. And, uh, you know, it, it just the, the craziness ensued. The, the politics were always the problem in WCW from the time the time worked took over. Were you still under contract when they went out of business? I was. I got caught, I think it was uh, for 28 more months, I believe 24 or 28 months left. Uh, what I couldn't understand when that happened was that for the first time in wrestling history in America was that Vince McMahon now had the opportunity to have a legitimate World Series or Super Bowl of wrestling. And that was the rumor we were hearing at the time. Uh, at Owen Hart's funeral at the wake, uh, what we had been hearing was that they were gonna angle light care, so Ultimate Warrior would be against Sting. Uh, Shane Douglas would be against The Rock, both my guys. This one would be against this one, this one would be against that one. And I think they really could have built something out of that, you know, is, uh, uh, for years, there were always those, you know, in the magazines, you know, what if Bob Backlund wrestled Ric Flair? What if Bruno San Martino wrestled Harley Race? What if, what if? For the first and only time in wrestling history, Vince McMahon had the ability to live out the what if and chose not to. And I won't go into your TNA run because we're running out of time, but uh, overall, are you happy that Dixie Carter is uh, out of power there? Because I understand you didn't have a good experience. What a missed opportunity. You know, you know, to start a wrestling company, today especially, it takes a fuckload of money, and it takes a fuckload of talent, and it takes a great network, and it takes a lot of luck. Uh, she had the money. She had as much money, if not more, to compete with Vince than Vince had, with Panned Energy being behind her. Talent. You go through that dressing room, the people they had in that dressing room over the, the course more of More star power at one point than WWE had. By far, by far. Then you look at the people they had there behind the scenes, you know, a litany of people, knowing what's up and what's down, knowing how to move this company forward. Uh, at no time did she ever take any of it that I was ever aware of. She used to come to me, I was the head of talent relations. She used to come to me every week and say, Vince Russo wants to do this in this match, what do you think? And I'd look at it and think, well, I know where the storyline's been, and I'd say, well, if you do that, then you're gonna have to turn this guy heel because, and I'd explain it. And then if you don't do that, then two weeks down the road, you're gonna have to do that. And I would explain the psychology and everything to her. Not one time in five years did she ever take my advice Two weeks later, or two and a half weeks later, we'd come back to do that taping. She would say, you're right, the fans are shitting all over it. To her, that was the 23 people that was on the internet talking about TNA on a blog somewhere. 23, oh, the fans are all shitting on it. They need to give that to, advice to her. And she wouldn't take that advice. The first night, I guess this sums it all up as to why TNA never ever worked. The first night I met Dixie Carr, she was introduced to us. I walked down to the green room after the production meeting and she followed me into the green room, knocked on the door and I brought her in and she said, my father, and she started reciting my resume to me like I didn't know it. And she said, my father's very impressed by what you've accomplished in your career. And uh, he's happy to have you here. And he wants me to ask you for one, if, if he wanted to ask you for one piece of advice as he's about to start on this, what would be the most important thing you could tell your tell my father? I was, whew, one piece of it, Dick says, I could give you a million pieces of advice. And we started just sitting there talking and bullshitting for a few minutes as, as I'm thinking in the back of my head, what one piece of advice, one piece. And it finally popped in my head, I thought, if there's only, if I could only give one piece of advice to your father, the, the most important piece of advice I could give him would be to in no way, shape, or form try to challenge Vince McMahon right now. 
don't try to be the WWF two, WWF junior, WWF light. Be TNA. It'd be the, the original TNA. And I said, like, e and then where I made my mistake was, I continued on, I said, like ECW, we went for the 18 to 49 male demographic, while Vince went for the tweeners. And we owned them. And I said, there were less of them, but their money was as green as anybody's. No sooner did I finish that sentence, and here was Dixie Carter's response. Why would we want to copy ECW? ECW, after all, they failed. And no sooner did she finish that sentence, the show had already started, the monitor's behind me. Dixie's standing over here in the doorway, the monitor's behind me. Whatever happened in the arena, the crowd starts chanting, ECW, ECW. So I didn't even answer, I just stepped back. I looked at the monitor and I looked back at Dixie. I looked back at the monitor. I looked back at Dixie and whew, went right over her head. Uh, you know, how could you be in professional wrestling and, and believe that ECW was a failure? Financial, yeah, and for a million reasons. Uh, but you don't hear fans chanting WWF or NWA today, uh, and you never will. You still hear them chanting ECW 20, almost 20 years after its demise. Uh, that sums it up to me about as, as much to show you it's hard to be more clueless than that. And Dixie Carter was that. And uh, just to finish up, I think we may have to do a part two with you at some point. Uh, we only scratched the surface. But uh, you now have a podcast, The Three yeah. Man Power Trip. How do yes. people listen to that? Well, we've been getting some really good feedback. Uh, I know for uh, a, a, a period of, I think, two weeks, we were number one on Podomatic. It's taken us some time, and we continue to grow each week. You know, it, it, it started off... Uh, uh, on one uh, uh, one uh, outlet, one uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Those all those phrases from uh, uh, one application uh, to now on iHeart, Podomatic, Spotify, uh, iTunes, um, and all, uh, Google Play, and always adding more. Uh, but I, I think with the podcast, what you know, how many times like I was telling my manager on the way up here, how many times. Can, how many wrestling stories are there to tell? If we want to talk about Monday Night Raw, we can tell five, 10, 20 stories about Raw, and they're all gonna be pretty much the same because we're all watching the same, same show. And so if you listen to Steve Austin's podcast talking about Raw, and then you listen to Taz's podcast talking about Raw. And then you listen to Chris Jericho on Westwood One talking about Raw. And then you listen to Colt Cabana talking about Raw. How many stories can you really hear, or different takes on a story can you hear about Raw before it starts to get, oh, I've already heard this, I already heard that, you know. And so to me, like what sets Taz's apart is that Taz talks a lot about sports on top of it. Uh, Jericho talks a lot about entertainment and music on top of it because it's connection through Fozzie. Uh, Austin talks about entertainment in general, movies and intersperses that, like pop culture with his. And with ours, you know, as, as hot of a topic as politics is in America today, and I think worldwide because of Trump, uh, that it's a really unique place that you can go for wrestling fans. I've often found a lot of wrestling fans, you know, so many people think wrestling fans are well, they're, you know, they just like wrestling and not much else. And my experience over my career has been that I've met some damned intelligent wrestling fans and, and fans of like any segment, wide variation of, of likes and dislikes. And I have a lot of people since the podcast coming up and saying, hey, I love the podcast, or hey, I disagree with you on this point, Shane, or hey, Shane, I think get your head up your ass on that point. But it, like I've often said in my career, talk good about me or talk bad about me. Muhammad Ali was so successful because half the crowd wanted to see him win, and the other half wanted to see him get his ass kicked. But everybody had an opinion. In wrestling, the same. I've tried to do the same thing with far less success than Muhammad Ali, but in politics, everybody has an opinion. You love it, you hate it, you love him or her, you hate him or her, everybody has an opinion. So why be, you know, Austin to Taz to Colt Cabana to or Jericho to, let's be the Triple Threat podcast and be completely separate and different than anybody. And I believe you have a Twitter address. So. Yeah, the Franchise SD, at, uh, hashtag Franchise SD. Uh, the podcast uh, can be uh, accessed through the two-man power trip of wrestling on iTunes. Uh, just go to their site and then click down. It's two buttons. Click on that. Scroll down. First one comes up is Triple Threat Podcast. Click on it. Uh, we continue to grow it out and uh, 
started to look for in discussions into talking to like CBS radio to iHeart radio to Westwood one radio and uh, other outlets out there to possibly take it to a wider syndication around the country uh, when I talk about things in politics so the fans understand this isn't just Shane Douglas's opinion you know, I read the paper today and I'm gonna give you my opinion on something uh, I've gone through and done first of all spent my entire uh, educational life learning this stuff from the time I was in sixth grade uh, through my two master's equivalencies and taught it for seven years uh, follow it and when any topic that comes up we get the itinerary for the week based on things the three of us uh, me and my co-host Chad and, and John Pozaski uh, that we uh, you know we kick ideas what do you think about this what do you think? and we finally craft what the itinerary will be uh, I go through and make sure I do hours of research on those topics, those political topics I'm going to talk about. This isn't just my opinion spewing off, you know, like current events in, in history class. Uh, it's well researched and, uh, uh, you know, not just my opinion. It's based off of what I, you know, what I'm, I'm doing, you know, finding my research. So, I, I think the next big thing for the podcast is that you know we've been kicking around the ideas, and it's just a, a bit of. Uh, you know, engineering hurdles that have to be gotten over is to have either call in guests or guests that we bring on the show, be it Francine or Taz or Steve Austin, uh, to, to get their input on these things as well. Uh, but, you know, we're always looking at ways to improve the podcast. And, you know, it's all, we're only going to episode 33, so it hasn't been around for a million years. And, you know, we, we've been stuck on one format. We've, you know, changed that we have sporadically throughout the, the 33 week run. Uh, we've had uh, individual topics per show. One was on the Gary Wolf uh, Broken Neck Angle, another was on uh, uh, this just past episode 32, was on the uh, Guilty as Charged 99 with uh, Angle with Taz, the Epic Angle with Ben Build Up for that year with Taz. And we have a segment called uh, AFA Ask Franchise Anything, where the fans can send in to, uh, let me make sure I get these right because they're a little bit hard, uh, hashtag the number three, the three threat pod, or the triple threat pod at gmail.com. The fans will send in their uh, questions there, and we, and John Paz will go through and he'll look and say well segment three we're going to be talking about trump doing this and here's a great question that re relates to that and he'll plug those in so it sort of seamlessly flows together uh it's been a lot of fun for me uh, and it's you know it's, it's something that's obviously i'm very passionate about and i think from what I, the feedback i'm getting on twitter and facebook there's a lot of fans out there that have the same type of uh, connection to it and and a lot of uh, a lot of people that really enjoy it so we're going to keep crafting it and working on that and see how we can hunt it down to make it even better well i'll wish you the best of luck with that and again i hope to uh maybe do a part two with you in the future love to thank you very much for talking to us i'm a little bit verbose in my career so it's, we'll get we'll get him to nail the rest out for you excellent appreciate it good seeing everybody This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com, and today on the line for the Great North Wrestling Podcast, we have former Canadian champion, unfortunately, I have to say that, um, but I did win the title back from him, I will say that, and also the reigning and first ever Great North Wrestling world television champion and i know he's had some uh, successful title defenses lately he is the nephew of jack briscoe and the son of jerry briscoe west briscoe what's going on hannibal what's going on i'm i'm still freezing out here training in the cold when i'm running outside while well, you're lucky enough to be in the nice climate of Florida right now. Another oh, reason man, I'm like sitting you. on the beach drinking a margarita right now. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're relaxing because uh, you have a pretty big title defense coming up May 12th in Brockville, Ontario, and it's going to be in a mixed martial arts cage. Um, you're going to be facing the six foot six. 
350-pound prodigy Nathan Banner, who you have had a match with in Great North Wrestling before, and I think, what was it, you won one fall, he won a fall, and it was ultimately ruled a, a draw or something like that? Yeah, and there's no draws when I wrestle. You know I came out with the W. But apparently the uh, Great North Wrestling Championship Committee has ruled that he had a recent victory over Scorpio and a couple other big victories. So they've ruled that he's now the number one contender for this world television title. So how are you preparing for this match inside of a cage? Well, first of all, we know that committee is all messed up right now. And you know what? I'm a fighting champion. And, you know, as the TV champion right now, I will just fit in against anybody. And if Nathan really, really earned that spot, and he's more than welcome to step in that cage with me. It's not the first time I stepped in a cage, and it won't be my last time stepping into a cage. Now, this is going to be more of a MMA-style match than you're used to. It's not going to be really your traditional uh, pro wrestling match. Do you think you'll have an advantage in this style of match with your amateur wrestling background? Yeah, definitely. Don't forget, you know, I'm a two-time state champion. I also have two different black belts, and I also did boxing as an amateur. So, you know, I'm not really scared to step in that cage, put in the gloves, or do whatever I have to do to, to, to keep that TV championship, because I'm going to do whatever it takes to walk out of that ring, number one. Actually, walk out of that cage, number one. Two different black belts. Uh, may I ask what those are in? Uh, I did one in Muay Thai and one in uh, Taekwondo. Very interesting. I did. I was not aware yeah, of that. Four, yeah, I spent 14 years uh, doing it. And you actually won a match uh, in Rockland last year prior to winning the 25-man battle royal to become the world television uh, champion. But something interesting happened in that battle royal, and it seemed like the fans were actually cheering for you to win the battle royal. Uh which is very unusual. Can you explain why this might be happening all of a sudden? Well, I think the uh, the fans are showing, are finally seeing my hard work, finally seeing my passion, finally seeing that I'm not just going to let the aces and eights, I'm not just going to let Jason dictate my match. I'm going to actually go out there and give it my all, put my heart out there, put my tears out there, put my blood out there, and be the real TV champion, which I'm destined to be. And speaking of your heart, uh, there seems to be a bit of uh, more than just a managerial relationship with this Valentine. Um, what, what's going on with you guys? Is she just your manager? What's happening? I saw the kiss after you won the title. Oh, uh, you know, it was just a kiss. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll keep that separate. We'll see what plays out in the future. But, you know, of course, you know, West Briscoe always kind of kind of stay single, you know. Kind of a ladies' man, and I love the ladies. So we'll see where that goes. You know, let's just take it one step at a time, and let's just worry about Nathan right now and worry about my love life another time. And I was reading on the internet, you were uh, you won the award for uh, Cauliflower Alley Futures Legends Award a few years ago. We're actually going to be covering the the Cauliflower Alley event this year for the Hannibal TV. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, on winning that award a couple years ago. That's a pretty big deal. You know that all, that award was actually a really big deal, and uh, I'm didn't have any clue that I was actually one of They actually told me by surprise and uh, snuck me in and said I have to watch my dad get some awards. So I went and sat at the dinner, and I was totally surprised when they uh, called my name up. And it was truly a honor and a great, just a great, great night. And I'm truly blessed to be able to get that award. And, you know, it means the world to me. And hopefully, you know, I'll live up to that uh, being a future legend. Well, it looked like you were uh, going to be signed by WWE again, possibly last year. I know you had uh, a tryout at the Performance Center. They even posted some pictures of your tryout on the website. T did you ever get any feedback on on what happened with that tryout? Um, no, everything went really well, and then I had a, um, kind of like a freak accident, and I had to, uh, you know, kind of fix up my knee a little bit. So I just kind of took some uh, time off to you know heal up some old injuries and make sure I'm a healthy 100%. So, you know, they never gave me a no, so just waiting for that call, you know. There's a hundred people waiting in line, and hopefully, you know, I'm somewhere up on the top of that list. 
Is there any favorite wrestler you have right now in that company? Someone that you you would like to possibly wrestle if you were to get a, a job back in WWE in the future? Randy Orton was one of the guys that I would always, you know, want to face just because I just love his style. I love how how great he is in the ring. And then also Finn Balor is another one and Seth Rollins. Those are, you know, some of the guys that I would love to get in there with. And with your uncle being a former NWA champion and your dad being really well known as an NWA legend, what are your thoughts on uh, all this stuff happening with Billy Corgan trying to uh, get the NWA title over again and everything that's going on well, with that? I hope I hope it works out. And I, you know, from what I heard, he really wants to make it like the old school way and. You know, I really uh, hope it works out. You know, I always wish every company the best because you want to see every company could succeed because that means more jobs for every wrestler. And you've had some matches for New Japan. You've traveled all over the UK. You've been in Puerto Rico. Um, I know Great North Wrestling is one of your bases now, but uh, is there any other place that you've been wrestling on a regular basis? Um, all over the place, man. I can't keep track. I mean, I'm in Detroit next week, and then from Detroit, I fly straight to Colorado. Um, just, I'm pretty much all over the place. You know, I love, I love going to different cities, and I love getting to show the fans, you know, what I'm capable of doing. And, you know, especially I love Canada, you know. Great North Wrestling is, you know, definitely the spot to be, and I love all the fans out there, and I love you know, the appreciation that they're showing me, and hopefully, you know, I can keep being their TV champion and representing them in a good way. And you're very well known for your time in TNA. They gave you a big push there with the Aces and Eights. It's now known as Impact Wrestling. They've done some tapings in Canada recently that I was on, but they're also back recording in Orlando um, with this new management here and this kind of non-exclusive contracts that they're doing, would you be interested in the future of uh, working for them again in some capacity? Man, um, anybody that pays me, I'll step in that ring again. So I don't, you know, don't really matter what company it is, as long as the money's good, you know, I'm down. Is there any type of training you're doing uh, specifically to uh, to fight this Nathan Banner, who's I know you've had matches with me and some bigger guys, but this guy is, this guy weighs a lot, 350 pounds. He's a big boy, so. Uh. Yeah, I've just been powerlifting, amateur wrestling, and boxing. Trying to box as much as I can and uh, getting that cardio up because even though he's six foot six, 300 pounds, I feel like I can uh, out cardio him and out move him in the ring. Uh, where can fans follow you on social media that are listening to this? Um, they can follow me at uh, West Briscoe 19 on Instagram, and then they can also follow me on Twitter at West Briscoe, the one with the blue check. And what's your message for Nathan Banner? I know he's going to be listening to this. You know what, Nathan? You know, we've had our struggles before. Apparently, you've had one up on me. i got one up on you. And I know right now you're the number one contender, and uh Hopefully you're training, because I'm training. Even though I'm sitting on the beach right now drinking a pina colada, looking at these girls walk by, I'm thinking about you, man. Me and you, it's going down. So get ready. Can't wait to see you in that cage, buddy. And all I can say is you're lucky that I have to fight Haku on this show, and then i got to get revenge on Quebec or Pierre, but after I'm done settling those disputes, if you somehow manage to slip by banner, I'll be going after that title. You know what, Hannibal? Bring it. You know, I always, you know, we've had our, uh, our really tough feuds before, but you know what? You're always someone that I do truly respect. And you know what? If I make it past Banner, which I will, you know, come on up. 